We now return to part two of the title Becoming a Vessel of Honor by Rebecca Brown. All scripture quotations are taken from the King James Version of the Holy Bible. Chapter 9. Defilement of God's Temple. Nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. 2. Timothy 2 19 21. Over and over throughout the New Testament, we are exhorted to cleanse ourselves, to purge our vessel, us. Our Lord Jesus Christ paid a terrible price on the cross so that we can depart from iniquity and become a vessel unto honor. There are two areas in which this purging is needed. The first is in the area of our sin nature. We must bring our sinful nature under control and put active sin out of our lives. Secondly, we must put all defilement out of the temple of God, us. I believe God's temple is not only defiled by active participation in sin but also by the presence of demons. This brings us to the hotly debated question, can a Christian have a demon dwelling inside of him? I believe scripture clearly shows us that he can. Demons cannot just hop into people whenever they want. We are hedged about so that they cannot get in unless we break a hole in the hedge of protection. Figure 9-1 Figure 9-1 Whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Ecclesiastes 10 8. Figure 9-2. Sin breaks a hole in hedge, opens a doorway in our lives. How do we break a hole in this protective hedge? By sin. I call such sins that permit the entrance of demons temple defiling sins. Why? Because the bottom line in this issue of demons and Christians is this, can the temple of God, us, be defiled, and if so, how does scripture define the term defilement? To answer this we must first turn to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God gave his people, the children of Israel, many pictures in their lives so that they would understand the coming of Christ and work he would accomplish. For instance, through the sin offerings, they were brought to understand the necessity of the shedding of innocent blood and the giving of life to pay the price for their sins. The sin offerings gave a poignant picture of what Jesus accomplished once and for all on the cross. In the same way, the temple of God, as built by King Solomon, was a picture of those of us who have come under the new covenant with Christ. We are the temple of God. With the Holy Spirit dwelling in us just as the presence of God dwelt in Solomon's temple. Figure 9-3 Figure 9-3 Solomon's Temple Let us go back now and look at the defilement of Solomon's temple. Here is a sketch of the temple. The temple itself faced north, Ezekiel 8:14. It was surrounded by a wall which had two gates in it, one in the north wall and one in the east wall. The brazen altar which was used for the sin offerings and the sea sat in front of the temple. The temple itself was divided into two parts. The front part was called the inner court, and the back part was called the Holy of Holies. The presence of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat. The high priest could enter this part of the temple only once per year. After Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam took the throne. But Rehoboam refused godly counsel and oppressed the people so that they rebelled and the nation of Israel was split into two parts. The city of Jerusalem was in the part called Judah, the other half of the country was called Israel. The evil king Manasseh set up altars right inside the temple to his demon gods. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 33, 5. From that time, the Lord tarried nearly a hundred years with prolonged periods of defilement of his house before removing his presence from the temple. The Israel half was carried off into captivity before the Judah half. Ezekiel prophesied from captivity in Babylon contemporary with Jeremiah who prophesied in Jerusalem. In Ezekiel chapters 8-10, the Lord transported Ezekiel in spirit from Babylon to Jerusalem to show him the defilement of his temple. Figure 9-4 Figure 9-4, idol by brazen altar. 
And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seed of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. Ezekiel 8, 3, 5. We do not know exactly what the idol looked like, but we do know that demons are associated with all idols. Paul wrote specifically about this. What say I then that the idol is anything? or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. 1 Corinthians 10 19 20. Clearly then, demons were present by the brazen altar with the idol. Next, the Lord showed Ezekiel the walls around the temple. Verse 10 says, So I went in and saw, and behold every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed upon the wall round about, Ezekiel 8:10. Now, what is the purpose these occultic drawings that resemble our modern graffiti? It is well known within all forms of witchcraft that demons are placed at the spot of an occult drawing. Therefore, there were demons placed upon the walls around about the temple. Now, look again at the drawing of the temple. The next action takes place just inside the north gate. Figure 9-5. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house which was toward the north, and, behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Ezekiel 8:14. Most Christians do not realize the significance of this statement. First of all, you must understand that the purpose of all occultic rituals is to bring demons to be present with the humans performing the ritual. So why were the women weeping for Tammuz? The women were participating in a common form of demon worship, practiced by the Babylonians. Tammuz was a demon god who was supposed to be Nimrod reincarnated. Who was Nimrod? Nimrod and his wife Samiramis were human beings and the leaders of the formation of demon worship after the flood. Nimrod is briefly referred to in Genesis 10, 9-10. Ancient history shows us that Nimrod is the same as Ninus, the first Assyrian king founder and builder of ancient Babylon where the Tower of Babel was built. Nimrod was worshipped in Egypt as Osiris. It is from the Egyptian records that we find an account of Nimrod's death which was a violent one. Apparently he was put to death by Noah's son Shem, in judgment for his abominable practices of demon worship. See the two Babylons, by Rev. Alexander Hislip. If there was one who was more deeply concerned in the tragic death of Nimrod than another, it was his wife Samiramis, who, from an originally humble position, had been raised to share with him the throne of Babylon. What, in this emergency shall she do? Shall she quietly forego the pomp and pride to which she has been raised? No. Though the death of her husband has given a rude shock to her power, yet her resolution and unbounded ambition were in no wise checked. On the contrary, her ambition took a still higher flight. In her life, her husband had been honored as a hero, in death she will have him worshipped as a god, yea, as the woman's promised seed. Zarashta, who was destined to bruise the serpent's head, and who, in doing so, was to have his own heel bruised. The patriarchs, and the ancient world in general, were perfectly acquainted with the grand primeval promise of Eden, and they knew right well that the bruising of the heel of the promised seed implied his death and that the curse could be removed from the world only by the death of the Grand Deliverer. If the promise about the bruising of the serpent's head, recorded in Genesis as made to our first parents, was actually made, and if all mankind were descended from them, then it might be expected that some trace of this promise would be found in all nations. And such is the fact. There is hardly a people or kindred on earth in whose mythology it is not shadowed forth, the two Babylons, by Reverend. Alexander Hislop, Loisos Brothers, New Jersey, 1916, pages 58-60. Samiramis proclaimed the dead Nimrod to be the deliverer promised by God to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Shortly after her husband's death, she had a son who was called Tammuz. 
Semiramis proclaimed Tom was to be Nimrod come back to life as promised by God and the great messianic promise given to Eve. Down through the ages and in every land around the world this false mother and child has been worshipped under various names. Semiramis became the queen of heaven and remains so to this day. Therefore, weeping for Tom was, was for the purpose of bringing Nimrod back to earth, and the demon worshipped by that name, to be present with the people performing the ceremony. Therefore, we clearly see that demons were inside the north gate. Figure 9-6 Figure 9-6, Worshipping the sun toward the east. Then the Lord told Ezekiel that he was going to show him the worst abomination of all. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Ezekiel 8:16. Worshipping the sun toward the east is a form of Egyptian demon worship, because it is worship of the Egyptian sun god Osiris which, as previously stated, was the Egyptian name for Nimrod. Again, the purpose was to bring demons to be present with the people. So, demons were right in the inner court of the temple 2 Chronicles 33, 5. Quoted earlier in this chapter, about Manasseh also clearly showed the presence of demons in the temple of God, and the presence of God had not yet left. Demons and the presence of God were together in the same temple. I believe this is a picture of what can happen to us. It was not until after the Lord had showed all these abominations to Ezekiel that Ezekiel then saw the glory of the Lord lift out of the temple and leave. But please remember. Earlier I showed you how this condition of defilement of demons being present in the temple had continued off and on over a period of almost a hundred years. Finally, God brought judgment. He removed his presence from the temple and then the temple was totally destroyed. Now, let's look at the New Testament. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the Temple of God is holy, which temple ye are, 1 Corinthians 3 16 17, these two verses are clearly addressed to Christians. Now, if it were not possible for the temple of God to be defiled, then this verse would not be in scripture. These verses carry a sober warning. Do not allow your temple to be defiled. If you do, eventually you will be destroyed. It is interesting that the same Greek word is used in these verses for defile and destroy, meaning to spoil, corrupt, destroy, to bring into a worse state, to deprave. A critical lexicon in concordance to the English and Greek New Testament, by Ethelbert W. Bullinger, Zonder Van Publishing, Grand Rapids, MI 1975, page 213. I believe the sense here is that the defilement a person permits into the temple, himself, will result in his destruction. For instance, if a person goes out and participates in a homosexual relationship, not only will he receive the defilement of demons, but he may also receive AIDS. The AIDS will destroy his physical body, thus destroying the temple. A born-again believer cannot expect God to protect him from AIDS if he participates in a homosexual encounter any more than he can expect God to protect him from receiving demons. I have had many people ask if I thought the destruction mentioned here meant loss of eternal salvation. I don't have all the final answers, but, in my personal opinion, I do not think so. I think the physical body will be destroyed, but the spirit and soul will go on to be with the Lord. However, the believer will suffer loss of rewards in heaven. In the verses just prior to the above statement, Paul addresses this issue. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 3 13 15 We hear very few sermons on these verses. People don't like to think about suffering loss in heaven. We want to think that we will all receive the same reward no matter what we do down here on earth. This simply is not true. A person may not lose their salvation, but, 
If they permit defilement to continue in their life, they will not receive the rewards they would otherwise have received had they lived a life in complete obedience to the Lord. One of the main arguments used against Christians having demons is what? Communion hath darkness with light. Now, let's look at that scripture in context. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness? And what conquered hath Christ with Belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2. Corinthians 6 14 18. This passage was addressed to the Christians at Corinth, so obviously some of them were already unequally yoked. Paul was telling them to clean up their lives. Therefore, this scripture cannot be used as a proof text that Christians cannot have demons. Just the opposite. Paul goes on in chapter 7 to write, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2. Corinthians 7, 1. And, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. 2 Timothy 2 19 21, we must purge our vessels and cleanse God's temple, U.S. Clearly, the spirit of God and demons dwelt within the same temple at the same time in the Old Testament. Clearly, scripture warns us about defiling the temple of God, us. Over and over again, we are exhorted to cleanse ourselves. The rest of this book has been written to help you obey God's word and cleanse yourself. Are you? Willing to allow a condition of defilement to exist in you? Chapter 10. The Spirit and the Spirit World. I find it interesting that in this time of unprecedented escalation of the occult and evil, there has probably never been a time when Christians, as a whole, believed less in the reality of the existence of the spirit realm and Satan and his kingdom. It was not necessary for any of the writers of scripture to teach about the reality of the spirit realm because the population as a whole already believed in it and knew about the occult. During the time of Moses, for instance, the Lord had no need to define, or describe, occult practices because the people generally knew very well what was being spoken about. The Israelites had just spent 400 years living in the Egyptian culture steeped in occultism and demon worship. But, today, few Christians have any idea what a wizard, or necromancer, is or what it means to divine. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Deuteronomy 18, 9-12 The Lord did not have to define the terms given in these verses because the people knew what he was talking about. Just as in the times of Jesus and the writing of the New Testament, Knowledge about the occult and demons was widespread. In fact, it was widespread knowledge that demons could do all sorts of things. So general at the time of our Lord was the belief in demons, and in the power of employing them, that even Josephus, and Vie 2, 5, contended that the power of conjuring up, and driving out demons, and of magical cures had been derived from King Hezekiah, to whom God had given it. Josephus declares, himself to have been an eyewitness of such a wonderful cure by the repetition of a magical formula. 
This illustrates the contention of the scribes that the miraculous cures of our Lord were due to demoniac agency, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, by Alfred Edersheim, Volume, I.I., E. Erdman's Pub, Company, Copyright 1947, Page 762. We must here bear in mind that the practice of magic was strictly prohibited to Israelites, and that, as a matter of principle at least, witchcraft, or magic, was supposed to have no power over Israel, if they owned and served their god, Chal 7b, Netter 32 a. But in this matter also, as will presently appear, comma theory and practice did not accord. Thus, under certain circumstances, the repetition of magical formulas was declared lawful even on the Sabbath, Sa'an. 101 a. Egypt was regarded as the home of magic, Kid 49b, Shab 75 a. In connection with this, it deserves notice that the Talmud, writings for Jewish made laws by the rabbis, ascribes the miracles of Jesus to magic, which he had learned during his stay in Egypt, having taken care, when he left, to insert under his skin its rules and formulas, since every traveler, on quitting the country, was searched, lest he should take to other lands the mysteries of magic, Shab 104b. Here it may be interesting to refer to some of the strange ideas which Rabbinism attached to the early Christians, as showing both the intercourse between the two parties, and that the Jews did not deny the gift of miracles in the Church, only ascribing its exercise to magic, the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, page 172. How different it is amongst the Christians of our day. The average Christian has no idea of what occultism is all about. This is why so many Christians are falling into Satan's traps. Through ignorance. Today, we need to come to a basic understanding of occultism so that we do not fall into the trap of accepting it as being from God. Occultic practices are rampant throughout Christian churches. Far too many Christians are turning more and more to occultic alternative forms of medicine, forms of divination, fortune-telling, and many other occultic abominations. Scripture is clear. If you have any dealings with the occult, you will be defiled. Leviticus 19.31 Hosea says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Hosea 4.6 Dear ones in Christ, let us wake up and cleanse ourselves from all such defilement. The purpose of this book is to help you understand the rapidly expanding world of the occult so that you can not only cleanse yourself from any involvement in it, but also so that you can avoid its traps. In order to understand the occultic world, it is essential that the Christian understand the human spirit and the existence of the spirit world. Within the spirit realm, there are only two masters, two sources of power. Jesus Christ or Satan. Satan's power is limited. The power of Jesus Christ is the absolute, unlimited power of Almighty God. The central purpose of all occultism is to achieve and maintain contact with the spirit world and the spirits therein. The occultist maintains this contact with the spirit world to gain power. Every human being on the face of this earth desires power. It is at the very root of our sin nature. Satan is only too happy to supply people with a false power to do what they want. He does this to keep them from turning to the one true God, Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, Christians, being human with sin natures, also desire power. Satan has brought massive deceptions into the Christian churches, making Christians think they are experiencing and using the power of God when, in some cases, they are actually using demonic power. If the Christian is going to stand firm in God's word against this last great onslaught by Satan, he must have a good scriptural understanding of the human spirit and the spirit world. How is it that we, as physical creatures, are able to maintain contact with the non-physical spirit realm? The answer is found in scripture. It is because God made us in his image. He created each one of us in three parts just as he is a trinity. We have a physical body, a soul and a spirit. It is through the spirit part of us that we can experience the spirit realm. This is true for both Christians and non-Christians. 
and the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5:23. Paul teaches us here that we humans are tripartite beings. That is, we have three parts, the body, soul, and spirit. He plainly states that all three must be cleansed and committed to Jesus, and that Jesus himself must enable us to keep all three parts blameless until his return. I believe that in the beginning, before the fall, God created man a trinity, three parts, in perfect unity even as God himself is in perfect unity. In other words, body, soul, and spirit were perfectly united. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, physical body, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, spirit, and man became a living soul, the self which manifests as our mind, will, and emotions, Genesis 2, 7. I believe the unfallen Adam and Eve had many abilities that we fallen humans do not have today. Why? Because of the perfect unity of their body, soul, and spirit. Where can we find an example of another perfect man? In Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was without sin. He is called the second or last Adam in many places in scripture. Even after his resurrection, Jesus still had a physical body. However, it was a glorified physical body such as we will have one day. Scripture tells us that we will one day have a body just like Jesus now has. In that day, we will be restored to an unfallen state and human beings will once again be a perfect unity. What were some of the characteristics of the perfect unified unfallen state? We see them in Jesus, especially after his resurrection. He could, with his physical body, do those things a spirit can do such as walk through walls. I believe there was a terrible severing at the fall. Body, soul, and spirit were no longer in their original relationship with each other. Stop to think a minute. What is one of the first characteristics you think of in someone that is totally demon-possessed? Unnatural strength. This strength is the result of the control over the physical body by a spirit, in this case a demon spirit. Those involved in the martial arts strive to achieve unnatural abilities with their physical bodies. Abilities that come only with the control of spirit over the physical. Since the fall, we human beings do not naturally have conscious control over our spirits. But, the occultists must achieve this control in order to maintain their vital contact with the spirit world. There are many lies in the whole area of occultic activities. Satan and his demons do not want human beings to understand what they are doing. So, they invent lies and perform false miracles to back up the lies. One of these is the third eye. The third eye dates back into antiquity. Third eye ability is the ability to see or gain contact with spirits. You see, our brain is like a computer with two channels of input. When we see something in the physical world, the image goes from the retina of our physical eye through special nerves back into our brain. The image of the physical object is then created in our brain and we see, the same is true of objects or spirits in the spirit world. Only, the information does not come through our physical eye. It comes through our spirit. Our brains are capable of receiving two sets of images at once, images from the physical world, and images from the spirit world. Figure 10-1 Figure 10-1. However, the demons do not teach people about their spirits. Instead they teach about a third eye. Sometimes, demons actually create a false physical third eye in the center of the forehead. Figure 10-2. Figure 10-2. Third eye. Occultists believe it is this third eye that gives them the ability to see the spirit world. They do not realize that they are actually using their spirit. Third eye abilities are also called psychic abilities. Now, we have the massive influx of the New Age movement with a whole new set of terminologies. Because the third eye is located in the center of the forehead, the New Agers call it centering instead of the third eye. Centering is the New Age term which means the process of gaining contact with the spirit world. In fact, as Satan adds deception to deception, the old occult terms are no longer used. We now have new and scientific sounding words. One of the most important things a Christian can do is demand a definition of terms. Exactly what do words mean? 
Let's look at some examples. Remember, there are only four different types of spirits, demon spirits, angels in God's service, human spirits, and God himself. New Age Terms Words that refer to one of the four types of spirits, energy, vibrations, electromagnetic vibrations, inner man, human spirit, counselor, demon spirits that used to be called spirit guides or familiar spirits, entity, force, higher powers, atman, specific in Hinduism for the human spirit, prana, a form of breathing, used in yoga, to bring about the flow of spirit power. Words that refer to contact with the spirit world. Self-realization, the ability to control your own spirit so that you can achieve contact with the spirit world. Higher state of consciousness, contact with spirits in the spirit world. God consciousness, contact with the spirit world because the new Agar thinks God is the entire spirit world. They make no difference between created spirits and the creator God. Alpha or theta level. Used in silver mind control and other places. A trance state where contact with the spirit world is achieved. In such a trance state, these brain waves predominate on an egg, thus the pseudoscientific term. Left brain, right brain, this whole theory is used to slide into contact with the spirit world. Higher state of consciousness, contact with spirits in the spirit world. Once you begin to define terms, you begin to understand that you are dealing with a God-forbidden contact with the spirit realm. Note, there is no such thing as impersonal vibrations or energies that people can use and control. All spiritual energy is very personal. It resides in a spirit of one of the four groups mentioned, demon, angel, human, or God. Human beings cannot control God or his power in any way. Therefore, if you are controlling an energy from the spirit world, you are using demons. I have written in detail about the human spirit and the occultists use of it in Prepare for War, Chapter 16. I will not repeat that information here. Down through the ages, Satan has consistently used three methods to get people into contact with the spirit world. Drugs, meditation, hypnosis, and trance states, all involve a blank mind. Visualization and guided imagery. The mind-altering drugs have been used all around the world in every culture by the wise men or shamans or witch doctors to gain contact with spirits. It is interesting that the hardcore Satanists of the Western world have no interest in taking such drugs as LSD. Why? Because they don't trip. On them. They see the spirit world most all the time anyway. They don't need a drug such as LSD to enable them to do this. The trips taken on such drugs are nothing more or less than experiences in the spirit realm. Demons are masters of deceit. They have the ability in the spirit realm to switch the sets just the same as men do in the movie making industry. If you visit Universal Studios, where many of the movies are made here in America, you can walk down one street and be in the Old West, turn the corner, and you are in 18th century England, turn another corner and you are in a different time and country. Demons can do the same thing in the spirit world and create all sorts of illusions for the humans under their control. The Eastern religions center around gaining contact with the spirit world. To do this, they have developed forms of meditation which involve relaxation techniques to blank the mind. Scripture tells us that we are responsible to control our minds at all times. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 once our minds are blank, the demons are free to take over and control them. Lastly, visualization and guided imagery is a very old technique for gaining contact with the spirit world. This one technique alone is responsible for thousands of Christians falling into the trap of using occultic techniques. See Prepare for War, Chapter 16. But, what are people actually doing when they gain contact with the spirit world? They are, in reality gaining conscious control over their spirit. I don't know what to call this control so I have called it establishing a link between soul and spirit. In some way, the conscious mind gains control over the spirit so that the person can use their spirit to look into the spirit world and communicate with spirits in the spirit world. Remember, our physical bodies cannot see or communicate with the invisible spirit realm in any way. 
This communication must come through our spirits. We cannot normally communicate with the spirit world. This linking together of soul and spirit was lost at the fall. The three techniques mentioned are used by occultists the world around to establish such control over their spirits. It is interesting that once a person comes to Jesus Christ out of the occult, they do not lose this ability until they specifically ask the Lord to sever between their soul and spirit according to Hebrews 4.12. Also, with those that do not come to Christ, on very rare occasions, I have asked the Lord to sever between their soul and spirit. When the Lord grants my request the person instantly loses their ability to communicate with the spirit world. Clearly, it is not the Lord's will for his people to have this control over their spirits. Our spirits are to be directly under the control of the Holy Spirit, not our minds. This is the basic difference between the occult and Christianity. Occultists control their contact with the spirit world, and they control to a large extent the power they use. Christians, on the other hand, are never in contact with the spirit world except on the brief occasions the Holy Spirit allows such contact, and Christians do not control the power of their God in any way. Christians are servants, nothing more. The Lord works through his servants as he chooses, not as they choose. Demons cooperate with humans to give them power when the people wanted to draw them ever farther away from the Lord. Let us be careful to walk in faith and obedience to our Lord. Do not let sinful desire for power draw you into Satan's traps. Chapter 11. Doorways. What is a doorway? The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I use the term doorway as a sin that defiles the temple. Through that doorway of sin demons can enter and cause havoc in our lives. I believe. There are only three areas of sin which fall into this category. They are, inheritance. Sexual sins. Any involvement in the occult. I have written in detail about many doorways in both of my first two books. I do not wish to repeat all of that information here. Rather, I am going to briefly list the most common doorways, and briefly describe only those I have not written about in the other two books. First, inheritance. Demons are inherited. This fact is very well known in the occultic world. It is also known within the Asian religions. Please see Prepare for War, page 131-133 for a more in-depth discussion of this doorway. Sexual Sins Demons are passed from one person to another through sexual sins. These sins fall into eight basic categories. Sex with the opposite sex outside of marriage. Sex with the same sex. Incest. Sex with children. Sex with animals. Sex with demons. Sadomasochism. Pornography. Any of these sexual sins will allow demons to come into the person committing the sin. Sexual molestation is one of the most common childhood doorways. It is always followed by a cycle of early sexual involvements on the part of the child with ever-increasing involvement in sexual sins as the person grows older. This is because of the demons placed into the child at an early age. Any involvement in the occult. The occult has a multitude of activities in which people become involved. It would take pages to list them all. I am going to break the occult up into categories and list the more common problems. Classic Occult Activities Scripture lists these as Divination Astrology Stargazing Wizard Necromancer Or Sorcery Forms of Witchcraft Consulter with Familiar Spirits Calling up the spirits of the dead or performing seances is the most common of these. Divination. Divination, the art that seeks to foresee or foretell future events or discover hidden knowledge. Webster's Dictionary. Most Christians realize that divination includes fortune telling, but it is the second half of the definition that gets people into trouble. Here is a list of common forms of divination. Palm reading. Crystal ball reading. Water witching. Pendulum. Divining rod. Tarot cards are some form of card reading. Tea leaf reading. Numerology. Study of animal entrails, as in the Santeria religion, however, there are modern forms of divination that are presented as scientific. Satan takes various procedures that will give a small amount of legitimate knowledge and then expands them to give very large amounts of knowledge. This is where divination comes in. 
Here is a list of some of these. Graphoanalysis. Handwriting analysis. A few facts can be discovered through handwriting analysis such as if the person is male or female, or if the article is a forgery. However, when they start telling you such things as you were involved in a painful accident at the age of 11 which causes you to have difficulty relating to people, look out. They are getting into divination. Most large corporations are now having graphoanalysis done on prospective employees. Unfortunately, many churches are falling into this trap. Iridology. The iris is the colored part of the eye. It is claimed that by merely looking into the iris any illness in the body can be diagnosed. Kinesiology. Please note that there is a science called kinesiology. The word comes from the Greek word kinesis, which means motion. Therefore, kinesiology is the study of human motion. It deals with the study of which muscles are involved with various movements of the body. I am not referring to this science. I am referring to alternative types of kinesiology such as applied kinesiology and behavioral kinesiology. Although such disciplines offer valuable insights into the function of our bodies, some practitioners have ventured far beyond the realm of science. I refer to such things as the diagnosing of illness through muscle testing. Some practitioners even claim to be able to diagnose the illness of a person at a distant location by proxy, testing your muscle strength while you simply think about your sick friend who lives many miles away. You will also find that books relating to alternative types of kinesiology promote the concepts of life energy, life force, acupressure holding points, acupuncture meridians, etc. Cytodoxology. Diagnosis of any illness from the supposed study of blood cells. Much information can be legitimately obtained by studying the blood, but it is impossible to diagnose all illnesses by studying one type of blood cell. Reflexology. Diagnosis of illness from reflexes. Hypnotism. Hypnotism is basically a demonic trance. It is in direct violation of God's word. We are commanded to take every thought captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, and to be sober and vigilant, 1 Peter 5, 8. We must always be alert. God holds us directly responsible for ourselves and our minds. Hypnotism requires submission of the person being hypnotized. Demons are always placed into a person through hypnotism. Anyone using this technique also has demons. God's people must stay clear of this trap. Acupuncture. Acupuncture originated in Asia. It is an integral part of the Asian religion. The needles are supposed to tap into the chi or spirit. Acupuncture provides a demonic healing. Acupressure. Acupressure works on the same principle as acupuncture. Color analysis. By this I do not mean fashion. I am talking about the type of analysis where you are told that certain colors affect your energy level, etc. Hair analysis. Diagnosis of illness by analyzing hair. Hair is protein very similar to fingernails. Other than a protein deficiency, illnesses cannot be diagnosed from hair. For an in-depth discussion of these techniques, I recommend a book called, Healing at Any Price? The Hidden Dangers of Alternative Medicine, by Samuel Pfeiffer, M.D., Word Publishing, Copyright 1988. Occultic Games and Toys. Occultic games and toys have saturated our stores. Such games as Dungeons and Dragons are a crash course in witchcraft. All role-playing games involve intense visualization which quickly brings the players into contact with the spirit world. Parents need to be extremely careful about the toys they buy for their children. The various monster toys are actually accurate replicas of demons as they appear in the spirit world. Children naturally go through a developmental stage where they use a lot of imagination and visualization. It is an easy step for demons that look like the toys to make contact with children playing with them. Nearly all the children's cartoons have occultic teachings in them. And, there is a massive move in our public schools to train children to become spiritualist mediums in the lower grades. If you have not already done so, I would strongly recommend that you obtain and read Like Lambs to the Slaughter, by Johanna Michelson. This book is an excellent expose of the occultism being taught in our schools. Every parent with a child in school should read this book.
Martial Arts It is very well known in the occultic world that demon spirits are the power used in the martial arts. However, there is a great deal of confusion concerning such things as self-defense. I think a good rule of thumb is that if you reach the point where you can do those things which would normally rend flesh and bone without getting hurt, then you are using demon spirit power. Seances. Seance, a spiritualist meeting to receive spirit communications, Webster's Dictionary. There are many forms of seances other than the old-fashioned seances around a table in a dark room. Remember, a seance is anything that calls up a spirit to receive communication from it. Here are some other seances, Ouija board. Bloody Mary, a game played by children in which a demon appears in a mirror to them. Meditation, to speak with a counselor or a spirit guide as in Silva mind control and many other techniques. Roman Catholicism, calling upon the saints and Mary for help. Other occultic doorways. Yoga. Eastern meditation. Visualization and guided imagery. Rock music. Use of crystals. ESP. Astral projection. Blood contracts of any kind, including becoming blood brothers. Sacrifices of any kind. Idols of any kind. Chants of any kind. The list is almost endless. I would recommend the reader to the chapter entitled Doorways and Prepare for War. I have discussed these doorways in detail in that book so I will not repeat that information here. Chapter 12. Deliverance. This book is written for all those children of God who hunger and thirst after a close personal relationship with Him. It is for those who long to hear His voice in their innermost being, who will not be satisfied with anything less than the experience of His presence and glory. It is for those who value such a relationship with their wonderful Creator enough to be willing to pay the price in their own lives to achieve it, the pain of daily carrying the cross. This book is for those who are willing to strive for holiness and obedience to our beloved Master, Jesus. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 there is a desperate need for God's people to wake up and bring holiness into their lives. The professing Christian church of the Western world today has settled down into a gospel of compromises with the world. Doctrines of prosperity and satisfaction of the fleshly desires are uppermost throughout the churches. No one wants to pay the price for living a truly separated and holy life. The consequent poverty in the average Christian's personal relationship with the Lord is astounding. The most common question I get from pastors over the phone is, is it really possible for the Lord to communicate with me directly? How tragic this is. Truly we are living in a church age characterized by the church of Laodicea. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Revelation 3 14 19 The glitter of Christian TV stars and Christian entertainment has blinded the eyes of God's people to their terrible poverty. The emotional highs induced by repeated choruses and emotional music in many church services completely drown out that still quiet voice of the Holy Spirit calling us to repentance and holiness. I believe A.W. Tozer summed it all up best in his book The Pursuit of God. Shallow lives, hollow religious philosophies, the preponderance of the element of fun in gospel meetings, the glorification of men, trust in religious externalities, quasi-religious fellowships, Salesmanship methods, the mistaking of dynamic personality for the power of the spirit. These n. such as these are the symptoms of an evil disease, a deep and serious malady of the soul, the pursuit of God, 
by A. W. Tozer, Christian Publications, Incorporated, 1982, page 69. Those of us who have accepted our Savior's gracious offer to wash away our sins by his precious blood shed on Calvary's cruel cross, must put sin and defilement out of our lives. Let us purge ourselves so that we may become a vessel unto honor. See 2 Timothy 2.21, the choice is yours. Will you become a vessel of honor or of dishonor? There is a little book by Philip Keller which I strongly urge everyone to obtain and read. In it, Keller beautifully describes a visit to a potter's home in Pakistan. He watched an expert potter making a vessel. Once more the stone began to turn. But just as suddenly it stopped a third time. The potter's shoulders slumped disconsolately. An abject look of dismay welled up in his tired eyes. In despair he pointed to a deep, ragged gouge that cut an angry gash in the body of the beautiful goblet. It was ruined beyond repair. In a gesture of frustration and utter futility he crushed the clay down upon the wheel. Beneath his hands it was again a formless mass of mud lying in a dark heap upon the stone. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Jeremiah 18, 4. What will the potter do now? Then the potter turned to look at me from his wobbly stool. His eyes were clouded, sad, like deep wells filled with remorse. He spoke softly, hesitantly. I will just make a crude peasant's finger bowl from the same clay, in the master's hands, by Philip Keller, Vine Books, 1987, pages 28-31. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Timothy 2 19 21, the choice is ours. Will we resist our master and thus become a vessel of dishonor? If we harden our hearts and resist the Holy Spirit as he convicts us that we need to cleanse ourselves, then we most surely end up a vessel of dishonor. Purging ourselves is what this chapter is all about. We must purge ourselves. The responsibility is on us. Over and over again in scripture we are exhorted to cleanse ourselves. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2:12. Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross, but it is our responsibility to take up the power and authority available to us in the name of Jesus to cleanse our temples, that is, us. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3:16-17 because the Holy Spirit dwells in those of us who have made Jesus Christ our Lord and Master and Savior, we must be careful to keep ourselves pure. That not only means that we must stop sinning, but we must also cleanse all filth out of the temple. That means demons. The more we come to know God, the more aware we will be of our sinful condition. It is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will show each individual something of the awesome greatness of our God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, 7. It is only as we come to a reverent appreciation of the greatness and utter holiness of our God that we will fall on our faces and cry out. Woe is me! For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 6, 5. Let us humble ourselves and get on our faces before the Lord and repent of our sins. Let us be careful to cleanse ourselves in order that we may become vessels that our master can use. Oh how I want to be a profitable servant for my master. It is my total heart's desire to please him. I cannot do this if I am careless about sin and careless about defilement in my temple, me. I have spent the last several chapters of this book talking about areas of sin that bring about defilement, 
or the dwelling of demons, in us. If you have been involved in any of these areas, then you need to cleanse yourself. It is my belief that the average Christian can cleanse himself through the power and authority given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing this chapter so that Christians can do justice. Unless you have been deeply involved in the occult, you do not need someone else to help you cleanse yourself. It is helpful if you have someone else who can pray with you, but, you need to get onto your face before God and do business with him one on one. Jesus is our mediator. We need no other. I urge you to cleanse yourself now. Do not delay. The time is short. I am convinced that our Lord's return is near. Will you purge your vessel in obedience to our Lord's commands? Or will you persist in rebellion and living a life of comfort and ease and become a vessel unto dishonor? The choice is yours. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Mark 16 17. Behold. I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10 19. Jesus gives his servants authority over demons in his name. Unfortunately, deliverance has gotten a very bad name in Christian churches because of the unscriptural practices many use in a deliverance. We all go through a learning process. I regret that I did not make a clear enough statement in my first book. He came to set the captives free, that the struggle I had with the demons in Elaine was because I was ignorant as to how to approach deliverance. The Lord demanded that I write my mistakes as well as my successes. I wish to emphasize that I do not speak with demons or allow the physical manifestations of demons now, that I did in those early days of this ministry. If I had known then what I know now, it would not have taken so many hours to deliver Elaine. As soon as I started my medical practice, I began to see people daily who were coming out of Satanism. Obviously, I could not spend many, many hours with each one in deliverance. Quickly I sought the Lord for the answer. My prayer went something like this, Lord, why is it that when Jesus commanded a demon to come out it came out immediately and I am spending an hour arguing and fighting just to get one to come out? The Lord's answer was short and to the point, exactly. You see, the fact that I was talking to and arguing with the demons was the problem. Not only was it the problem, it was sin. Why? First, because I was allowing the person being delivered to fall into the sin of becoming a medium. What is a medium? A medium is a person who allows spirits to speak through them. See Webster's Dictionary, God strictly forbids this. See Deuteronomy 18 10 12, far too many times. Deliverance workers will ask the person being delivered to just relax and let the demons speak through them. They are directly asking the person to sin. Secondly, Scripture strictly forbids the practice of familiar spirits. See Deuteronomy 18 10 12. What does it mean to consult a familiar spirit? It means to speak to a demon to obtain information from it. Witches have special demons that they use all the time to gain information from. When the deliverance worker relies on gaining information from the demons themselves about who they are and how they got in, etc., the worker is himself falling into the sin of having a familiar spirit, or consulting with a demon spirit. Lastly, we Christians are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? 2 Corinthians 6:15. The Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ has no conquered or fellowship or agreement with Belial or any demon spirit. Therefore, any Christian who allows a demon to take over and control his body in any way is sinning. The book of James, especially chapters 3 and 4, teaches us that we are responsible to control our bodies. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle, control, the whole body. James 3, 2, James 4. 8 tells us to cleanse our hands and hearts. There are many scriptures that make reference to our responsibility to control our bodies. The major hindrance to deliverance is sin. We must not sin by obtaining information from demons, neither must we allow the people we work with to sin by becoming a medium or channel for demons to speak through. These practices are condemned by God's word. The Lord then showed me that deliverance must be a step in faith. Our whole Christian walk is based on faith. 
Everything we receive from the Lord we receive by faith. Deliverance is no different. How does faith operate in deliverance? It is like this, faith equals absolute acceptance, as fact, that God always performs his word. Therefore, deliverance is based upon God's word. We accept as fact, that, when we comply with God's commands, he will always keep his promises. Deliverance is based upon the following scriptures. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Luke 10 19. If we repent and confess our sins, God will cleanse us. It is just that simple. The only basis for deliverance is true. Repentance. Repentance. To turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. To feel sorrow, regret, or contrition for, Webster's. Dictionary. You cannot deliver someone who is continuing in active sin, or who doesn't want to be delivered. There are four simple steps in deliverance. Step 1. Define the doorways or temple defiling sins. Step 2. Repent and confess those sins asking God for forgiveness and cleansing. Step 3. Command the demons that came in through those sins to get out of you forever. Step 4. Stop sinning. Saturate your life with God's word. When deliverance is done as a step in faith, demonic manifestation will not be permitted. This was a major key in helping me to understand how the Lord wanted deliverance to be done. No wonder I had such a terrible time trying to get the demons out of someone. As I permitted the demons to speak through a person, I was, in reality, asking that person to sin, and I was sinning too. It is most difficult to get a demon to come out of someone while they are engaging in active sin. Once I realized this and started approaching deliverance as a step in faith, there were no more fights with the demons. Deliverance became very simple. We human beings make things so complicated. God makes everything simple. Deliverance then is like this. Repent for the sin that allowed demons to come in. Command the demons to leave that came in through that sin. Accept by faith that God always performs his word. If a person truly repents for his her sin, God will cleanse, and the demons have to leave. Once confession of sin and commanding the demons to leave is accomplished, the person accepts in faith that they are gone. Now, let us look at each of the four steps in deliverance one by one. Step 1. Define the doorways or temple defiling sins. As I stated in chapter 11, I do not believe that demons can come into a person through just any sin. I believe that what I call temple defiling sins fall into the three categories, inheritance, any involvement with the occult, sexual sins, I have written about many specific sins within these three areas in the preceding chapters. The first step is to sit down with a pen and paper in hand and carefully go through your life from birth to present. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your memory any sins you may have forgotten. Make a list of them on the paper. I have found that it is helpful to make the list of sins in chronological order, that is, start with birth, and list them as you committed them down through the years to the present time. If you are counseling someone, ask them to tell you about their life from their earliest memories on. Look for sins that fall into these three areas. Do not fall into the trap of mistaking symptoms for doorways. People will frequently come to the deliverance worker complaining of such things as depression, anger, violent temper, etc. These are just symptoms. The underlying cause is the sin that allowed the demons to come into the person. All demons will cause depression, anger, rebellion, hatred, etc. Always look for the root cause. Next, be methodical. I find that one of the most common reasons for an incomplete deliverance is because people were not methodical. That is why everything must be written down on a piece of paper. If you do not write it down, the demons will confuse your mind and make you forget. It is not necessary for the deliverance worker to ask a person to give them details, especially in the area of sexual sins. If you do, you will be opening the door for all kinds of temptation through lust. For example, there are eight areas under sexual sins. I simply ask people if they have been involved in one or more of these areas. If so, 
Then I ask them to write down the names of the specific people with whom they have been involved so that they can confess each sexual contact individually. But I do not ask them for any details. Here are the categories of sexual sins. Sex with the opposite sex outside of marriage. Sex with the same sex. Incest. Sex with children. Sex with animals. Sex with demons. Sadomasochism. Pornography. As you help someone make up a list of the doorways in his life, it is important to try to get an understanding of just how much passivity the person practices. People involved in the occult, and especially with problems of depression and suicide, usually have very lazy and passive minds. People in the occult have become used to blanking out their minds, thereby giving control of their entire mind and body to the demons. These people must be carefully taught how to regain control over their minds before deliverance can be successful, and also to enable them to keep the demons out after deliverance. I have also found it most helpful to question the person to see just how much control the demons have over them. As the years have passed, the Lord has steadily shown me that the less passive a person is in their deliverance, the more likely they are to remain free of demons once they are set free. It is also helpful to find out just how much control the person has established over his spirit, and or how much control somebody else has established over that person's spirit. You should keep two lists of sins. One list is for the sins that allow demons to come into a person, temple defiling sins. The other list is of sins that are not demonic doorways, but are still sins that need to be confessed. Please see Appendix A for help with the second list. The deliverance worker must always be much in prayer. If the Holy Spirit does not give you a peace that the person you are helping has been completely honest with you in making the list of doorways, do not proceed beyond this step. I never cease to be amazed at the way people can lie. Over and over again I have had people look at me so innocently and tell me that they have told me about all of their doorways when they have deliberately left out major areas of sin. Don't be afraid to wait. Never go into deliverance unless the Lord specifically tells you to do so. Step 2. Repent and confess those sins asking God for forgiveness and cleansing. I think it is very unfortunate that so little repentance is preached these days. Rarely do Christians sit down and make out a list of every sin they can think of and specifically confess those sins to God. I find that those people who do this at the time of initial salvation have very little trouble believing that they are saved. Too many Christians struggle with assurance of salvation. If Christians would be more diligent in confessing their sins, I believe that few would have this struggle. When confessing sins, the person should confess every sin he can think of. But he needs to command demons to leave only when confessing those sins that allow demons to come into him. See Appendix A. I believe that a specific listing and confession of sins as I am advocating is one way of fulfilling James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Comma James 5.16 Sins were committed one by one. They should be confessed one by one as much as possible. As a person repents for his sins and asks the Lord to forgive and cleanse him, he takes away any legal ground the demons have to cling to. That is why deliverance done in this manner is so much quicker and easier. It took 10 hours to completely deliver Elaine. Since the Lord taught me this approach to deliverance, I can now help someone as deeply infested with demons as Elaine was to a complete deliverance in a couple of hours. If you do not feel a person is truly repentant for his sins, then do not go any further. Wait for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction into their lives. This may take days, weeks months, or years. Again, you must be very sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in each case. Step 3. Command the demons that came in through temple defiling sins to get out of you forever. Many people ask why they, themselves, should command the demons out when Jesus clearly commanded the demons to leave people. I believe it is because we have the Holy Spirit available to us now. The Holy Spirit was not available to people during the time Jesus walked and taught on this earth. After Jesus ascended to the Father and left this earth, we entered into a whole new dispensation. Scripture now exhorts Christians to cleanse themselves and work out your own salvation, Philippians 2 12. 
We have a responsibility now that those people did not have in the days before the giving of the Holy Spirit. I have also found that once a person establishes authority over the demons within himself, the demons have to go. This is particularly true for those who have been involved in the occult. People in the occult are used to obeying the demons and letting them do pretty much whatever they want to do. It is a big step for them to realize that once they serve Jesus Christ they now have more power in Jesus than the demons have. It is absolutely necessary that people establish authority over the demons within them in the name of Jesus. If they do not, they will not be able to keep the demons out after deliverance. It is not necessary to know the names of all the demons. It is not necessary to command the demons to come out one by one. Command the demons to come out by the sins that let them in. The only time you should deal with specific demon names is with people involved in the occult who work with familiar spirits. These familiars must be rebuked individually and commanded to leave by name. But, the people already know the names of these demons. If they tell you they do not, they are lying. It is never necessary to allow a demon to manifest or speak through the person. The more the person being delivered controls the demons inside of himself, the quicker and easier the deliverance will be. The most common question is, if the demons don't manifest, then how do we know they have left? The answer is simple. Because the Holy Spirit tells you. Remember, demons are spirits, and as such, we cannot see them. If you are relying on physical manifestations to let you know the demons have left, you will be fooled because the demons can easily fake physical symptoms of leaving. Only the Holy Spirit can see the demons. You must rely upon him for guidance. Also, if the person has truly repented and confessed his sins, the demons have to leave. So you accept in faith that they are gone because God always performs his word. Step 4. Stop sinning. Saturate your life with God's word. However, there is a most important point in all of this that many people overlook. That is step 4 in deliverance, stop sinning. You must be a true believer in Jesus Christ to have authority over demons. But, you cannot be a believer without also being an obeyer. If ye love me, keep my commandments, he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. John 14 15, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father which is in heaven. Matthew 7 21. There is no substitute for obedience. If you think you believe in and are serving Jesus, but are not also obeying his commands as given in the Bible, you are lying to yourself. You are not a believer unless you are also an obeyer. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. Unfortunately, usually only the second half of this verse is quoted. I cannot emphasize enough the necessity of the first half. If we are not submitted to the Lord and obeying his commands, we cannot hope to have any power over demons. It is not uncommon for me to stop counseling with someone because they are unwilling to put active sin out of their lives. It is simply a waste of time to try to deliver someone who is living in active sin. Many times I have simply prayed with a person and asked the Holy Spirit to convict them of their sins. I also ask the Lord to work in their life in whatever way is necessary to bring them to a place where they are willing to give up their sins. Too often people seek deliverance only to gain relief from their problems, not because they want to serve the Lord and live a life pleasing to Him. Post-deliverance problems. I have found that there are five general areas of problems people experience after deliverance. Fear that the demons are back in. Demands for emotional rewards. Passive mind. Unwilling to put up with demonic harassment which is part of the reaping period. Discipline of the flesh or sin nature. 1. Fear that the demons are back in. This is the most common problem of all. People are continually afraid that the demons have gotten back into them. There are only two ways that demons can get back into a person after deliverance. If the person commits a temple defiling sin. If the person directly asks the demons to come back and remember, the demons can cause the same physical symptoms from the outside that they did from the inside. 
physical symptoms, or thoughts, are not proof that the demons are back inside. The person must stand in faith that they are gone. If the person commits a temple defiling sin thus opening a doorway, the demons will all come back in and many more besides. People who have been in the occult are particularly tempted with doing just one more incantation to get their own way. If they do, they have just asked all the demons to come back into them. Also, remember, scripture says rebellion is the same as the sin of witchcraft. You cannot rebel against the Lord's commands. If you persist in walking in disobedience and rebellion, you will be unable to keep the demons from returning. Often I have people tell me that they don't feel any different after deliverance. That's okay. There is no feeling in faith. The fruits of their life will show that they are clear. You cannot rely upon feelings when dealing with a spirit world. 2. Demands for emotional rewards. Oh how we human beings love emotional rewards. People always want to feel something. They want to feel the demons leave. They want to feel the love of God. They want to feel good. This walk of ours is in faith. There are no feelings in faith. One of the first things the Lord does is wean us away from emotional rewards. You obey. Regardless of how you feel. You function regardless of how you feel. Demons are only too happy to give us emotional highs to get us into bondage to them. People after deliverance should not seek emotional highs thinking these are spiritual experiences. One of the most common complaints I get is that someone doesn't think he is clear from the demons because he doesn't feel like reading his Bible or praying. Our sin nature will keep us from feeling like doing the things God requires. We cannot use that as an indication that demons are inside of us or outside of us. People who have had demons living in them for long periods of time get very addicted to the emotional rewards the demons give them. It is a matter of self-discipline to begin to walk in obedience and faith to our Lord without the emotional highs we desire. 3. Passive Mind. This is an area of great difficulty. The mind is like a muscle. If you don't use it for a period of time it becomes weak and flabby. It is painful to rebuild a muscle that has not been used. It is a hundred times more painful and difficult to regain the use of a passive mind. If someone has been used to blanking out his mind, he will tend to do this after deliverance. Every time someone allows his mind to go blank, he has directly opened a doorway for demons to come back inside of himself. As soon as he realizes that he allowed his mind to go blank, he must confess that sin and then command all the demons to leave him immediately that came in while he was blanked out. I have found that the best way to rebuild a passive mind is through intensive scripture memory and plain old mathematical tables. One reason why most people hate math is because of the mental discipline it takes to memorize the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division tables. That is why the companies who make calculators make so much money. Because people are basically lazy. I often have people who have been involved in eastern forms of occultic meditation drill on mathematical tables in addition to scripture memory. This is very helpful in overcoming a passive mind. 4. Unwilling to put up with demonic harassment which is part of the reaping period. Jesus told us in a parable that when a demon is cast out that it will get seven others stronger than himself and come back to try to get in. See Luke 11 24-26. I always tell people that the battle to stay clear after deliverance is always seven times worse than it was to get clear in the first place. Many people are simply unwilling to put up with any discomfort whatsoever. They demand that their problems be taken care of so that they do not have any difficulties at all. This just is not possible. Galatians 6, 7-8 tells us that we will reap what we sow. If we have sown in sin, allowing demons to come into us then we are going to reap. Part of the reaping is the demonic torment that comes as the demons try to get back in after deliverance. Physical symptoms are common. Remember, the demons can cause the same physical symptoms from the outside as they do from the inside. One of the common forms of demonic torment after deliverance is a noise in the ears. People are unwilling to put up with this, saying that they have not been delivered. They refuse to accept the reaping process and fight the demons. People become weary if they have to rebuke demons or demonic thoughts more than two or three times. In the battle to stay clear after deliverance, 
They will have to rebuke the demons thousands of times. They will have to be consistent in their stand for the Lord. Demons never wear out with repetition. People wear out very quickly. In the case of demonic thoughts, rebuke the demons once or twice. Then force your mind onto scripture and ignore the demons. The most common thing the demons will do is flash thoughts into the person's mind telling him that he is not delivered, that the demons are back inside. The person must stand in faith that this is not so. In the case of physical torment, you must rebuke the demons, and then stand. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Ephesians 6 13, just standing is the hardest thing of all for us to do. Please read chapter 4 of Prepare for War for a more complete discussion of the reaping period. 5. Discipline of the flesh or sin nature. People who have allowed demons to dwell inside them rarely discipline their sin nature. This is especially true for those who have been involved in the occult. Please see chapter 10 of this book for a discussion of the sin nature. It is imperative that people put sin out of their lives after deliverance. They cannot stay clear if they do not do so. Case Histories I am going to give a series of case histories to try to help demonstrate how to look for doorways. All of these are true case histories, but I have changed the names of everyone to protect those involved. I am dealing with the deliverance of people involved in Satanism in a separate chapter. Case number 1, Susan not your real name, 33 years old. Susan knew nothing about her father because he left her mother before she was born. However, there was a long line of mental illness in her mother's family and many of her mother's relatives were deeply involved in the Masons and the Shriners. Doorways, Inheritance, Masons, Shriners, Mental Illness, Susan was raised as a so-so Catholic. She rarely attended church, but she was baptized in the church, was confirmed and received communion occasionally. Doorways, Roman Catholicism, Baptism, Confirmation, Communion. When Susan was three years old her mother remarried. Her stepfather started abusing her when she was four years old. He forced her into sexual relations and bestiality. Doorways, Incest, Bestiality. As is typical for children who have been sexually molested. Susan became involved in multiple sexual contacts by her early teens. Doorways, multiple sexual partners. Susan was an apt pupil and quickly learned to read tarot cards, play with the Ouija board, and how to become a spiritualist medium. She also participated in hypnosis, voodoo, and finally, astral projection. Doorways, witchcraft, tarot cards, Ouija board, hypnosis, voodoo astral projection. However, during Susan's 16th year, she had a horrifying experience while she was astral projecting. Because of this experience, she decided to give up formal witchcraft. But, as she looked for something to take its place, she knocked on all the wrong doors. Susan left the foster home and became involved in transcendental meditation and drugs and alcohol. As she frequented the various bars, she became attracted to the gay bars and entered into a lesbian lifestyle. Doorways, TM, drugs, alcohol, lesbianism. Susan was a bright student and continued on to college. She graduated with a degree in psychology and sociology and became a counselor for a government program. However, demons of sexual perversion seem to have a twin that walks hand in hand with them. That is violence. Susan found that she was growing more and more violent. She had many fights with her various lesbian partners as bitter jealousy is a common part of all lesbian and or homosexual relationships. Doorways, violence, multiple lesbian partners. In 1982 Susan got in a terrible fight with her lesbian partner and killed her. She went to prison. The killing was ruled involuntary manslaughter, so she only spent 25 months in jail. Doorways. Murder. While Susan was in jail, she did some serious thinking. She decided that her life had to change. She withdrew from everybody. She totally put alcohol and drugs out of her life and withdrew from an active lesbian lifestyle as well. She was released early on good behavior. But, the parole board demanded that after her release she regularly attend the gay AA, 
and join the Metropolitan Community Church. The Metropolitan Community Church is not a Christian church, because they do not accept the complete Word of God as it is written in the Bible. It is a church of all gay people. Because of her enforced association with gays, Susan quickly fell back into lesbian relationships and violent fights. It was with one of her partners that a turning point in her life came. One night, while quarreling with her partner, Susan saw a demon surface and manifest through the other girl. Because of her experience in witchcraft years before, she recognized the demon for what it was. That frightened her. She told her partner that she needed help. They did not know where to turn for help with the demon, but a few days later saw an advertisement on TV for a Christian tent meeting being held in their area. Susan talked her partner into going to see if someone at the tent meeting could get rid of the demon. Both girls went to the tent meeting, but Susan's partner freaked out and left within the first five minutes of the service. Susan stayed, interested to see what would happen as she had never been in a Christian service of any kind. She told me that the only thing that got through to her mind during that service was the statement the preacher made that narrow is the way and few there be that find it. She did not know what this narrow way was, but she became determined to find out. After the service she went forward to stand in the prayer line hoping to have an opportunity to ask somebody about this narrow way. As the preacher came down the line, he stopped before Susan to pray. He did not give her achens to ask any questions, but reached out to put his hand on her forehead. She was told later by people who were there that the instant the preacher's hand touched her, her body jerked back and flew into the air doing two backflips and landing on the ground more than 20 feet away from where she had been standing. Susan never felt the impact because she was unconscious. It so happened that this was a charismatic tent meeting, so several people gathered around Susan, laid their hands on her, and prayed over her in tongues. Susan regained consciousness speaking in tongues. The people all rejoiced and told Susan that she was saved, delivered, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, Susan had absolutely no idea how to get saved or what it meant to be saved. She did not know who Jesus was or what he had done. The people at that tent meeting had made a very serious error. They thought that the Holy Spirit works in some sort of magic way, knocking people unconscious and setting everything right while they are out. This just is not so. The demons knocked Susan out, and she most certainly was not saved or delivered. Doorways false tongues. The one good thing that came out of that experience was that Susan decided that now that she was saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, that she should get a Bible and find a church. She did get a Bible, but never spent any time eating it as she could not understand it. She joined a charismatic Episcopal church and decided to go straight. She attended the church less than three months when she was invited to join their counseling staff. Susan still wasn't saved. But, because of her experience with TM and hypnosis, she quickly became expert at their counseling techniques of inner healing by a visualization and self-hypnosis. Doorways, TM, hypnosis, inner healing, visualization, self-hypnosis, because Susan decided to go straight, she was encouraged to get married as a solution to her lesbian problem. She married a young man who was also on the counseling staff of the church. That marriage lasted only six months because Susan soon found out that this man was a hardcore Satanist and she was scared to death by the things he did. Doorways, demons from husband who was a Satanist. After her divorce, she left the church and quickly fell back into her old pattern of lesbian relationships and violent quarrels. Six months before I met her, Susan came across my first book. It was as she read a book that she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and severed her relationship with her current lesbian partner. She came to me six months later for help. That is when Susan was finally and completely delivered. You may think this story is unusual, but let me tell you that this type of history is common. I cannot begin to count the number of people I have counseled with who have very similar stories. From Susan's history, I not only gained a list of doorways, but I also knew that she had the link established between her soul and spirit because of her contact with the spirit world. This was first established at the age of 14 when she started to train in witchcraft, mediumship, and astral projection. 
Susan had a severe problem with a passive mind because of her extensive practice of transcendental meditation and self-hypnosis. By the time I saw her, she was having difficulty holding a steady job because she could no longer control when her mind would blank out. She would go blank at crucial times and lose her job as a result. The problem of a passive mind proved to be the worst thing Susan had to deal with after deliverance. Here is a list of her doorways, and here is how we approached her deliverance. Doorways. Inheritance. Masonry. Shriners. Mental illness. And. Inheritance from father unknown. However, because of the history, there is sure to be some inheritance from her father, so that was broken as well. Roman Catholicism. Baptism. Confirmation, communion, incest, bestiality, multiple sexual contacts in her teens, witchcraft, mediumship, tarot cards, voodoo, hypnosis, Ouija board, astral projection, TM, drugs, drunkenness, lesbianism, multiple partners, violence and murder, demon of false tongues, visualization. Inner healing practices including self-hypnosis. Demons from husband who was a Satanist. Deliverance procedure. Step 1. Susan reaffirmed her acceptance of Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. She prayed specifically asking the Lord Jesus Christ to become her total master as well. Then she made a statement out loud telling Satan and his demons that she was now a servant of Jesus Christ and would never serve them again as long as she lived. Step 2. Susan worked through the list of doorways. She checked off each one. As she finished it. Closing the doorways is a two-step procedure. Here are samples. Prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I humbly ask you to cleanse me from everything I have inherited from both my father and mother. I refuse to have anything from Satan in my life. Please break those lines of inheritance forever. I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Statement. In the name of Jesus Christ my Lord, I now command every demon that came into me by inheritance to leave me at once. In the name of Jesus Christ, I break any and all oaths taken by my relatives and masonry and shriners that are binding upon their offspring. I command every demon associated with masonry and the shriners to leave me at once in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord. Prayer, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask you to forgive me for my involvement in Roman Catholicism. Please cleanse me from all of those sins. I ask you for it and thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord, I renounce all of my involvement in Roman Catholicism. In the name of Jesus I command every demon that came into me through Catholic baptism, confirmation, and communion and any other practices that I may have participated in to leave me at once. Prayer, Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ your Son, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me for the sin of incest with my stepfather. I thank you for forgiveness, in the name of Jesus. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command every demon that came into me through all the sexual relationships I had with my stepfather to leave me now. Prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus, I humbly ask you to forgive me for participating in bestiality. Please cleanse me completely for this terrible sin. Thank you so much for cleansing me in the name of Jesus. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord, I now command every demon that came into me through the practice of bestiality to leave me at once. Prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to completely cleanse me from all the many sins I committed and the many sexual contacts I had during my teenage years. I now recognize all of that to be an abomination to you and repent for those sins. Thank you for your cleansing in the name of Jesus Christ. She also repented of specific relationships by name as much as she could remember. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I now command every demon that came into me through the many sexual contacts I had in my teenage years to leave me at once. Prayer, Father, in the precious name of Jesus. I humbly ask your forgiveness for all of my involvement in witchcraft. I renounce all of that and repent for it and will never do it again. Please, Father, cleanse me from all of that sin. I thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I completely renounce all of my involvement in witchcraft. 
I command every demon that came into me through my practice of witchcraft to leave me at once in the name of Jesus. Prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask your forgiveness for allowing my body to be used as a medium for demons to speak through. I humbly ask you to completely cleanse me from my sins of functioning as a spiritualist medium. I thank you for it in the precious name of Jesus. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord. I hereby renounce all of my involvement as a spiritualist medium. I command every demon who came into me as a result of my functioning as a medium to leave me at once etc, etc. In this way, Susan worked through every doorway she had opened. She confessed her sin and repented for it, asking God the Father for cleansing. Then she commanded the demons that came into her through that sin to leave. Step 3, because Susan had been involved in witchcraft mediumship, astral projection, hypnosis, TM, and visualization, we knew that she was very much in communication with the spirit world. She had learned to control her spirit body, thereby establishing that demonic link between her soul and spirit. In people who have developed communication with the spirit world, I then have them do a final general clearing after closing all the doorways. General Clearing Spirit Sever between soul and spirit. Mind. Will. Emotions. Physical body. Prayer. Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for my sinful use of my spirit and to completely cleanse my spirit of any remaining demons. I ask you to seal it so that no one can ever control it again except you. I thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Statement. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord. I command every demon remaining in, or afflicting my spirit, to leave me at once. Never again will my spirit be used to serve Satan or any of you demons. Prayer, sever between soul and spirit, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to completely and forever take away my ability to communicate with the spirit world in any way, except what the Holy Spirit wants me to receive. Therefore, I am asking you to once and for all sever between my soul and spirit as in Hebrews 4.12 and remove all demons that give me the ability to control my spirit and communicate with the spirit world. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command all demons linking my soul and spirit which give me the ability to communicate with the spirit world and astral project to leave me at once. Prayer, Mind, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ I ask you to completely cleanse and heal and renew my mind. I ask your forgiveness for all those times I deliberately gave up the control of my mind. I want to use my mind to serve and honor you. Please help me to regain the control of my mind. I thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command every demon left in my mind, or afflicting my mind, to leave me at once. Prayer. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me for using my will to participate in so much sin. I also ask you to forgive me for allowing my will to become so passive to allow the demons to control me. Please cleanse my will and send your Holy Spirit to work in my will to help me to will to do your good pleasure. See Philippians 2.13 Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord. I command every demon in my will or afflicting my will to leave me at once. Prayer, Emotion, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for all my hatred and bitterness and lust and every other sinful emotion. Please forgive me for living to please my own emotions. Please cleanse my emotions and heal them so that they will be pleasing to you. Statement, In the name of Jesus Christ my Lord. I command every demon in my emotions or afflicting my emotions to leave me at once. Prayer, Physical Body, Heavenly Father, I humbly and sincerely repent for all the terrible things I have done with my body, sinning against you. In the name of Jesus, I ask you to completely cleanse my body and heal it. Please, Lord, help me to use my physical body to glorify you and to honor you in everything I do. I thank you for it in the precious name of Jesus. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command every demon left within my physical body to leave me at once. Comments, Susan had great difficulty in kicking out the demons that came into her through TM, hypnosis, and visualization. She had spent many hours blanking her mind in her extensive use of TM. 
As she tried to command those demons to come out, she would lose consciousness or become very confused. She struggled for an hour or more, binding those demons over and over again until at last she established authority over them. She prayed and asked the Lord to help her and strengthen her as she exerted her will against blanking out her mind for the first time in her life. Post-deliverance follow-up. After deliverance, Susan continued to have a struggle with her mind. She had allowed her mind to become extremely passive. She forced herself into a scripture memory program. During the first few weeks, she fell repeatedly by allowing her mind to go blank. Each time she realized that her mind had blanked for a period of time, she immediately confessed that as sin and commanded the demons that had come back into her during the time she was blanked out, to leave at once in the name of Jesus Christ. The struggle was intense, but over a period of months, Susan gradually regained more and more control of her mind. As she did so, she was again able to hold a steady job. Susan also had a struggle learning to walk by faith rather than feelings. She was used to living with many emotional extremes. Emotional highs, lust, and many emotional lows as well. She wanted to feel God's love and experience emotional highs by feeling God's love. She wanted to feel joy and desired to read the scriptures, rather than doing so out of obedience in spite of how she felt. Over the months, as she set her will to walk in obedience to God's commandments in the Bible in spite of her feelings, her emotions began to smooth out so that she did not experience such great emotional swings. Anyone who is infested with demons for so many years, like Susan was, must understand that it takes a minimum of one year to stabilize after deliverance. It takes time and persistence and obedience to God's word to develop a walk with the Lord in faith. Be patient. The Lord will make big changes in your life, but it does take time. Case number 2, Ron, not his real name, 30 years old. Ron came to me with the chief complaint that he could no longer read his Bible or pray, except in tongues. He had almost continual abdominal pain, difficulty sleeping, and much depression. He had been seeking help from various churches for the past year without success. His mother came across my books and asked Ron to read them. After reading them, he called and asked to see me. I agreed, and counseled with Ron with a pastor who works with me. I wish to emphasize again that I never counsel with men alone. I always work with another brother in Christ who leads the session. Here is Ron's story as we began to question him about his life. Ron was born to Christian parents who were missionaries in Mexico. He did not know of any problems of inheritance as both of his parents came from a long line of Christian families. All went well until Ron turned 16. At that time, his folks came back to the U.S. for a year. During that time, his mother fell into adultery and the marriage split as a result. In the emotional struggle Ron went through over his parents' divorce, he sought the Lord personally for the first time. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He had a deep experience with the Lord and became very enthusiastic to serve the Lord. Reading his Bible and praying was his joy. About six months after his salvation, Ron was asked to go to a Christian camp for a youth revival. He went and greatly enjoyed the weekend. The camp was a good one except for one thing. They taught wrongly about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. At the end of the last service at the camp which was a very emotional one, an invitation was given to all those who wanted to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of course Ron wanted it, so he went up to the altar for prayer. Unfortunately, the people at the altar were told to close their eyes and hold up their arms and hands. Then they were told to shake their arms and hands, relaxing them, and then to completely stop controlling their arms and hands, to clear out their minds, and give up the control of their mind and body to the Holy Spirit. They were told that, as they did this, that the Holy Spirit would then be free to come into them and completely take them over. Ron was too young a Christian to realize the error in this teaching, so he tried to follow the instructions completely. Ron said that, as he began to relax his arms and hands and try to clear his mind of thoughts, he suddenly felt something take hold of his hands. Then he felt a charge of energy go down his arms into his stomach with such force that it knocked him over backwards. 
He felt like a ball of fire was in his stomach which spread up into his chest and he began to speak in tongues. He was overjoyed and went home thinking that he had been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, Ron had fulfilled the conditions to receive a demon by blanking his mind and giving up the control of his body. Shortly after the camp, someone gave Ron a book on how to hear the Lord speak to you. This book taught that a Christian must blank out his mind or clear his mind of all thoughts and wait quietly on the Lord so that the Holy Spirit can speak to them. This is, of course, completely an error, but Ron accepted it as truth because that is how he started speaking in tongues at the camp meeting. As Ron practiced, he learned to blank out his mind quickly and experienced many times of emotional ecstasy which he interpreted as experiencing the presence of the Lord. Through these times of meditation, Ron obtained three spirit guides. What do you suppose they call themselves? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of course. What else would demon spirit guides call themselves to a Christian? Of course Ron did not realize that these were demon spirit guides. He thought he was hearing from the Lord. He had long conversations with the Lord and received many directions from these spirits. However, Ron should have realized that he was not hearing from the true Lord when the spirits began to lead him into sin. They told Ron that he was special and twisted and turned scripture to condone all sorts of sin that went directly against God's commandments. Ron went to a Christian college and then on to seminary. While he was in school, his three spirit guides quickly lead him into pornography, multiple sexual relationships, and, finally, homosexuality. Ron finished school and became an associate pastor in a large charismatic church in Texas. He was the youth pastor. While in this church, he became involved in inner healing using visualization and guided imagery. Because of his ability to blank his mind and contact the spirit world, he became expert at these techniques and was much in demand on the counseling staff of the church. He steadily drew more and more of the young boys into a homosexual experience all the time justifying his sins by his three demon spirit guides. After about three years working as a youth pastor, God, in his mercy began to work in Ron's life. A Christian brother came to Ron's church and challenged him, telling him that his experiences in the spirit world were not of God. Ron was shocked and could not accept the possibility that he was being deceived. Then, as a result of this brother's challenge, Ron began to get convicted that his homosexual encounters were sin. He decided to go straight and get married. Ron began to date a young woman who was also on the counseling staff at the church. However, this girl was a witch. She wanted to marry Ron, and began to bring him under her control. Ron got scared when he realized that this girl was controlling his whole life. He tried to break off their relationship and that's when the trouble began. Every time Ron was not physically in this girl's presence, he experienced severe abdominal pain. He quickly reached the point where he could not read his Bible at all nor could he pray, except in tongues. Frightened and depressed, Ron ran. He quit his job as associate pastor at the church and went north to another state seeking help to get free from the incantations the witch had placed on him. He went from church to church for a year without any help. That's when he came to us. We talked to Ron extensively, making up a list of doorways. Ron had great difficulty accepting the fact that the three spirits he heard from so regularly were actually demon spirit guides. We showed him from scripture that these spirits proved their nature by the fact that they had led Ron into all sorts of sexual sins. For the first time, Ron had to squarely face the fact that God did not make any special exceptions to his commandments as the spirit guides had told Ron. Ron was particularly hesitant to give up his tongues. He argued that the only way he could pray was in tongues. That in itself was proof that his tongues were not from the Holy Spirit. The demons had Ron in so much bondage that he literally could not pray in English. He could do so only under the control of the demon in a demonic tongue. We spent several hours with Ron helping him to pray through all the doorways to repent and close them and command the demons to leave. As Ron prayed, the Lord did a remarkable work, steadily revealing to him more sins that he had forgotten to tell us about. After Ron had closed each doorway individually, he went through and also did a general clearing of spirit, 
severing between soul and spirit, soul and body, as I described in case number one. After it was all over, we were all exhausted. We heaved a big sigh of relief and sat back on the floor from where we had been kneeling. Wow, Ron, I remarked, the Holy Spirit really did a powerful work in you. Wasn't that wonderful how he kept showing you areas you had forgotten to tell us about? Ron shook his head saying, yes, I guess so, but I don't think anything happened. What do you mean, I asked. I mean, I don't think any of the demons left because I didn't feel anything. It was only the grace of the Lord that kept me from wringing Ron's neck right there on the spot. It was very late and we had all just spent about five exhausting hours with him, and he didn't think anything had happened because he didn't feel anything. This is a very good demonstration of the trap so many thousands of Christians have fallen into. If they don't feel something, they don't think anything has happened. There is no feeling in faith. Follow up. Ron had a very difficult year after his deliverance. He continually demanded emotional rewards, and felt that the Lord was not interested in a relationship with him because he did not give Ron the feelings he wanted. Ron also continued to have the abdominal pain though not as severe. I told him that the demons could and would create the same symptoms from the outside as from the inside. But Ron refused to accept any discomfort at all. I urged him to go for a complete medical evaluation, which he did. The doctors were unable to find anything physically wrong. The pastor that helped me with Ron continued to counsel with him and eventually got Ron established in a good Christian church. I urged Ron to spend much time in Bible study and scripture memory. I also counseled him to ask the Lord to speak to him only through the scriptures for a period of time because Ron was so used to receiving communication from demons. It was a very rough year. But Ron began to grow spiritually and accept a walk in faith. He experienced an immediate release in prayer after deliverance and could read his Bible without difficulty. He obtained a secular job and brought discipline into his life. I lost contact with him after a year, but by the time his abdominal pain had stopped and he was actively growing in the Lord. It grieves my heart as I see such terrible damage being done through wrong teaching to young people who are on fire to serve the Lord. How many Rons are there in our churches today? I think we would be amazed if we knew. How these things must grieve the heart of our Lord. I cannot praise the Lord enough for His patience and marvelous grace in our lives and the lives of such people as Ron. Truly, Jesus did come to set the captives free. Case number 3, Sam, not his real name, 18 years old. Sam was 18 years old when we first saw him. He heard about my books through a Bible study he was attending, but had not read them by the time he came to me. He came to me because of a horrifying experience he had two weeks previously. He was seeking an explanation for the experience. Sam was in his bedroom one evening when suddenly he smelled a terrible odor like burning sulfur. Suddenly two huge demons came up through the floor of his bedroom and appeared to him. The demons told him that he was not the Christian he thought he was. They said that he was actually serving Satan and that Satan was demanding that Sam sign a contract in his own blood selling himself body, soul, and spirit to Satan. They went on to say that Sam must demonstrate his absolute faithfulness and submission to Satan by killing the teacher of his current Bible study. After telling Sam all of this, the demons vanished as suddenly as they had come. Sam wondered at first if he had been dreaming. But the whole experience was far too real to be a dream. He talked to his Bible study teacher about the episode and she referred him to me. To say that Sam was shaken up is to put it very mildly. Prior to the visit by the demons, Sam had not even believed they existed and certainly never believed they could come to see him. Quite obviously, there had to be a lot more to Sam's story than this one visit by demons. I want to emphasize again that you must not get sidetracked looking at symptoms or one occurrence. There is always a root cause. I asked Sam to tell me about his life in as much detail as he could remember. This is his story. Sam was born to Christian parents. He was raised in a very strict Christian home and attended only Christian schools. At the age of five, Sam had a visitation by Jesus and was called to preach the gospel. As a result, all of his life, Sam had planned to become a pastor. All went well until Sam turned 13 years old. Suddenly, 
To his horror, Sam began to experience very strong homosexual desires. Sam had never been sexually molested or participated in pornography or homosexuality of any kind. He did not listen to rock music, go to movies, or even watch TV except on rare occasions. Sam knew from God's word that homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord. He did not dare talk with anyone about the problem because he did not know anyone who would understand. Sam struggled alone with the homosexual urges. He did not participate in any homosexual act of any kind. The more he struggled to put the urges and desires out of his mind, the worse they seemed to get. At the age of 15, Sam entered a Christian high school. The homosexual desires grew steadily in intensity such that Sam fell into a deep depression over the problem which seemed to have no solution. His grades began to suffer as he had always made very high grades. By the end of his first year in high school, Sam was so depressed that he tried to commit suicide by taking a large overdose of pills. He was rushed to the hospital unconscious, but his life was saved. Sam went to the pastor of his church for counseling, but could not bring himself to tell the pastor his true problem. The whole suicide attempt was passed off as a reaction to the stress of a new school in the first year of high school. When Sam entered his second year, he started drinking alcohol to try to cope with his depression. As the alcohol took away Sam's inhibitions, he began to experiment with homosexual contacts. He hated what he was doing and knew it was wrong, but could not stop himself. His life became an endless cycle of repentance and crying out to God to help him, then depression because no help came, then drinking to cope with the depression, then homosexual experiences and back to guilt and repentance. Over and over the cycle continued throughout his last three years at high school. Sam noticed that immediately after his first physical homosexual encounter, he suddenly had a violent temper and had trouble controlling blind rages. Sam had never had a problem with a violent temper before. He found that thoughts of murdering someone filled his mind much of the time. This was something Sam had never experienced before. This increased his guilt, depression, drinking, and the whole vicious cycle. After graduation from high school, Sam was enrolled in a Christian college where he planned to study to become a pastor. He cut off his contact with his homosexual partners during the summer before college and started attending the extra Bible study in an effort to put an end to his problem. It was in August, one month before Sam was due to leave for college that the demons appeared to him. After listening to Sam's story, I knew we were facing two major problems. Demons had come into Sam through the suicide attempt, drunkenness, and homosexual acts, of course. But, where did the homosexual urges come from in the first place? Clearly from a demon within Sam, but what was the doorway? The second problem was this. Sam clearly had a special calling by God. But from all Sam said, I was not convinced that he was even saved. I cannot. Count the number of people who come to me for counseling who have been raised in Christian homes and attended Christian churches all of their lives who are not saved. They just assume that they are. First things first. I challenge Sam. Sam, if you were to drop dead this very moment, where would you go, heaven or hell? He paused a moment and said soberly, well, I hope I would go to heaven, there was my answer. Sam wasn't saved, just as I suspected. I went on to question him further. Tell me Sam, did you give an answer to those demons? Sam shook his head. No, I wanted to tell them to get lost that I would never serve Satan, but I just couldn't. I don't understand why. Clearly, Sam was demonically bound. The Christian brother with whom I was working on this occasion had never seen a case of demonic bondage preventing salvation. So I pushed Sam a bit more to clearly show this brother what was going on. Sam, I said, choose right now who you are going to serve. Are you going to serve Satan, or are you going to serve Jesus Christ? Sam moved restlessly. Rebecca, I want to choose, but I just can't. I really can't. I got up and handed Sam a marker for the blackboard which was in the office. I went to the board and drew a line down the center. I wrote Satan on one side. Jesus on the other side. Then I asked Sam. Here, 
You know scripture better than any 18-year-old I have ever met. I want you to write down the pros and cons of serving Satan and serving Jesus. Then make your decision. Sam went to the board and wrote down scripture after scripture. It didn't take him long to fill up the board. When he was finished he turned to us and said, The answer is obvious. There is no benefit at all in serving Satan. Okay, I said, then make your decision, Sam. W-H-O are you going to serve? Sam sat down in defeat. I want to decide for Jesus, but I just can't. Oh, it is useless. I am unable to make a decision. No it isn't, Sam. What you don't realize is that the demons within you are literally binding you from accepting Christ. In fact, they have bound you from infancy. You know you are called by Jesus Christ into a ministry, but you have never been able to actually make Jesus your Lord and Savior, have you? Sam nodded. Yes, that is correct. I couldn't tell anyone in my family or at church. They all knew I had been visited by Jesus at the age of five. They all knew I was called to preach. How could I tell them that I wasn't even saved? I just couldn't. Pastors, just how many people are in your congregations with this terrible problem? I urge you to get on your face before the Lord and find out. Then talk to your people. Let them know these sorts of problems exist so they won't be afraid to talk to you about it. I then asked the Christian brother working with me to anoint Sam with oil and take authority over the demons inside of him and bind them in the name of Jesus Christ. He did so. Before Jack had completely finished his prayer Sam scrambled out of his chair and fell onto his knees on the floor, tears streaming down his face. He cried and cried and prayed asking Jesus to forgive him and wash away his sins with his precious blood. He asked Jesus Christ to become his Lord and Savior and Master and completely committed his life to Christ. Sam spent some time weeping before the Lord and confessing his sins. He got up off that floor a different boy. I can tell you. Once Sam was really saved, then we started looking for the root cause of his problem. It has been my experience that demons of sexual sins that are either inherited or placed in children at a very young age, raise their ugly heads at puberty. When the hormones begin to flow, as youngsters reach the age of 12 to 14 years old, the sexual demons rise up to take over. This is what had happened with Sam. Sam did not have any childhood or wish that we could discover. We then turned our attention to the possibility of inheritance. Sam's mother was from generations of Christians. But his father's story was different. Prior to marrying his mother, Sam's father had been a man with a multitude of sexual encounters, although Sam did not know of any homosexuality in his father. Sam's mother became engaged to his father knowing that he was not a Christian. Finally. The night before their wedding, his mother told her husband-to-be that if he did not accept Christ that night that there would be no wedding the following day. Sam's father made a profession of faith that night, but one wonders just how sincere it was. Sam said that their marriage was not a particularly happy one, but that to his knowledge, his father had never had any sexual encounters outside of the marriage. He attended church regularly, though not very enthusiastically. There was the source of Sam's inheritance, his father. Sam then went through and confessed all the doorways and kicked out all the demons that had come into him through those doorways. To review, his doorways were inheritance, suicide attempt, drunkenness, homosexual acts, violence. It has been my experience, as I remarked earlier, that violence and murder go hand in hand with demons of homosexuality. I don't know why that is. It just is a fact. After Sam finished kicking out all the demons, I said to him, Sam, you now have one piece of unfinished business to take care of. He looked at me questioningly. What is that? You have not yet given those demons and Satan a direct answer to their demand that you serve them. A big grin came on Sam's face. He jumped to his feet. You're right, he exclaimed. Satan and you demons. I will never serve you as long as I live. I am now a servant of Jesus Christ and will serve him forever. In the precious name of Jesus Christ my Lord, I command you to leave me forever and ever. I have remained in contact with Sam for two years following his deliverance. He continued to have a struggle with homosexual urges in his thoughts. 
The demons placed these into his mind from the outside. He put himself on a scripture memory program and vigorously disciplined his mind to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. The battle has not been easy, but Sam in growing in the Lord and has not fallen into drunkenness or homosexuality since his deliverance. I praise God for his wondrous work in Sam's life. I could write a book of case histories alone. However, I believe these three will give you a good example of how to approach deliverance. I have written a separate chapter on the deliverance of those who have been involved in Satanism. I will briefly touch on a few other areas here. Deliverance of those involved in Asian religions. This is an area of deliverance in which I will freely admit that I have more questions than answers. Those people who become involved in Asian religions and Eastern forms of meditation develop extremely passive minds. The other major problem is the massive use of brainwashing techniques and hypnosis. There are deep demonic hooks left in their minds. These hooks can be a sight, a word, a gesture, or just a smell which will trigger a trance and complete demonic control. I do not, at this point, know how to go about removing these demonic hooks. Such a person can seem to be completely delivered, but will suddenly go into a trance a state where their mind goes blank and they lose control, for no known reason. This state, of course, allows the demons to come flooding back into them. I am seeing a very great deal of this in people coming out of various involvements in the New Age movement. Those people who come under the control of the various gurus take an additional very dangerous step. You see the Western world Satanists know they are doing wrong, but they are willing to do it to gain power. Those people who come completely under the control of a guru, lose the ability to distinguish wrong from right and accept evil as being good. I have never yet seen anyone in such a state delivered. The major problem with everyone coming out of an Eastern form of meditation and Asian religions is overcoming their passive mind. Beware. The one thing that hinders demons from freely operating through a human being is their free will. God has given each one of us the precious gift of free will. The goal of all Asian forms of religion is to get the human being to totally give up their free will. This enables the demons to take them over and use them however they want. I believe that it is a serious sin to give up our free will. God himself does not override our free will. Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit works in us to enable us to will to do God's will. See Philippians 2.13, I frequently. Have people ask God for forgiveness for giving up their free will and ask Him to restore their free will to them. This seems to be a key to helping them establish dominance over the demons within them. Deliverance of Children I cannot emphasize strongly enough the need to deliver children at a very early age. Parents, if you have had to close doorways in your own lives, then you must sever the lines of inheritance in your children and command the demons to leave which they inherited. I wrote about the deliverance of children in Prepare for War, so I will not repeat that information here. I just want to add a few notes. The deliverance of children who have been raised by parents involved in the occult is very difficult. This is another area in which I have more questions than answers. Once a child reaches the age of about four years, he she quickly learns to control the demons within them. It is at this point where the terrible trouble starts. Little children have great difficulty being consistent. But, more than that, it is very difficult to persuade a small child that he she should not do something that benefits them. Once you kick the demons out, the first time the child wants something he cannot get, he will ask the demons to come back and so he can use them to get what he wants. The cycle seems to be endless. Don't ever underestimate the demonic strength children can wield. I had one little six-year-old boy live in my home for four months. He had been raised in a satanic coven. He was so very powerful in his use of witchcraft that he killed one of our pets just by looking at it, broke one of my bones with one of his incantations, and nearly killed two other people. This child had been specially birthed for a high position in the craft and was given very powerful demons at birth. We tried to bring him to Christ but he refused to leave the demons out for more than a day or so at a time because he always wanted to use them for his benefit. He controlled every kid in his class at school and the teachers as well. When he started first grade, 
He was reading at third grade level within two days. Of course, his demon spirit guide did the reading for him. We could always tell the few days when this boy did not have his demons because he flunked every paper he did at school that day. He would make perfect scores on everything the other days. Parents, be alert for symptoms of demonization in your children. Any signs of sexual maturity or function or interest in children beyond what is normal for their age should be a very strong warning signal. Attempts to kill, either humans or animals is a sure sign. Frequent nightmares with demonic contents, and the many symptoms I gave in the chapter on ritualistic child abuse and prepare for war should never be overlooked. I strongly recommend Dr. Dobson's book The Strong Will Child. This book does not deal with demon-possessed children, but the principles in the book will be most helpful to any parent with such a child. Parents must be absolutely consistent in their discipline of such children. The child must be taught that life is much more pleasant when they keep the demons out than when they let them in. Parents must command the demons within the child to be bound before punishing the child, or the child will use this demons so that he will feel no pain at all. See next chapter for additional information on deliverance in cases of ritualistic abuse. Parents, be alert to the toys and cartoons your children play with and watch. One of the most common spirit guides I am finding in children is She-Ra, Princess of Darkness from the He-Man cartoon. When I asked the child how he she knew She-Ra was a spirit, the answer always is, as I played with her and watched the cartoon she came and told me so. Deliverance of those involved in Roman Catholicism The basic problem of Roman Catholicism is the idolatry that is practiced. I would urge the Reader to look at the chapter on Catholicism and prepare for war. I find four common symptoms in people who have come out of Roman Catholicism and accepted Christ but were never delivered. An almost continual struggle to gain assurance of salvation. A strong, tormenting desire or compulsion to go back and partake of Catholic communion. A tendency towards self-mutilation because of the penance that is commonly practiced within the church. Some who have frequent visions or experiences in the spirit world. This comes from the occultic communication and prayers to the spirits of dead people such as Mary and the various saints. Establishment of the link between the soul and spirit is rather common. Symptoms which occur with the link between soul and spirit. Frequent visions or communication with the spirit world. Ability to control when a person will receive a vision or communication from the spirit world. Ability to see auras. Auras are various types and colors of light around people and things. Ability to see demons frequently. History of involvement in any of the following. Astral projection or other out-of-the-body experiences. Visualization and guided imagery. Any form of Eastern meditation or anything that blanks the mind. Ability to see spirits in a mirror, or changes in a reflection in a mirror. Ability to see the game in D&D or other fantasy role-playing games. Sexual contacts with spirits, always be alert to these, they are common. Ability to levitate objects. Ability to see and or hear demon spirits. Anyone who has served as a spiritualist medium or channel. Involvement in the martial arts. Involvement in biofeedback. Hypnosis, especially the ability to hypnotize somebody else. Contact with UFOs or extraterrestrials. Sex with demons. This is an area that very few people are willing to write about because they are afraid of the ridicule it will bring. Most Christians laugh at the very thought and say it is impossible. But the occultists know the reality of it, and so does the world. Just two months before the publication of this book CBS put a two-hour film on primetime TV called The Entity a film telling a true story that happened in Los Angeles in 1976 and was researched by people from UCLA. It is the story of a young woman with three children who was divorced and raising her children alone. Suddenly, she was attacked and raped by an unseen being one evening. The attacks continued and involved the children and eventually the researchers. That film broke my heart. How accurately it portrayed the utter helplessness of any human being in the face of demonic power. If only that woman had been a Christian and had known the power available through the name of Jesus Christ. At the end of the film, it said that she had moved to Texas, but now, more than ten years later, was still suffering from these attacks, 
though not as frequently. How I pray that our Lord will bring this woman across the path of some Christian who will not laugh at her or say that what she is experiencing is impossible, but will share with her the answer, the power in our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to read another book that deals briefly with these problems, it is Earth's Earliest Ages, by G.H. Pember. It is available through Craigle Publications, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Genesis 6, 4 and other scriptures leave us little doubt of the validity of these people's experiences. Such sexual sin is an abomination to our Lord. But, we Christians must be able to help people be set free from captivity to this form of sin. People in all forms of witchcraft, Satanism, and Eastern religions all experience sexual intercourse of various sorts with spirits. In Asian countries this is called astral sex. How does it occur? The physical partner experiences all the physical sensations of sex although the partner is a spirit and not physical at all. People involved in Satanism commonly have sex with demons. The problem is, once they turn to Christ, the demons are unwilling to give them up. There is a very real struggle after deliverance to fight off the demons who would come and rape the person time after time. The only way is to fight. I remember one young woman in her thirties I worked with who had been extensively used and abused sexually, in the craft. After salvation and deliverance, she had a terrible time with demons coming at night to rape her. At first, she gave in because of the terrible physical pain involved if she tried to resist them. Every time she gave in, many demons would be placed into her through the sexual encounter. We talked extensively about the problem. Finally, I showed her the scripture in Hebrews. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, Hebrews 12, 4. I told her that she must ask the Lord for extra grace to bear any pain involved in resisting the demonic onslaught to the bitter end. She finally did this. The next time a demon came to have sex with her, she started rebuking it in the name of Jesus and commanding it to be bound and leave at once. The demons created very severe pain in her, but she hung on and continued to rebuke it and command it to leave in the name of Jesus. No matter how much pain the demon inflicted, this woman had made up her mind that she would resist to the end. This she did and the demon finally left without being able to complete the sexual act. It only took about three times of such battling and she had the complete victory. Another common tactic is for demons to come to rape someone and hit them while they are asleep. If the person will pray before going to sleep and ask the Holy Spirit to wake them up and alert them just before the demon attacks, they can start rebuking and commanding the demon to stop and leave just before it hits. In this way, it is possible to have the victory. Many times sexual encounters with demons will be interpreted as being dreams, but the person awakes sexually aroused. This can be the cause of frequent wet dreams in men. The sin of masturbation frequently leads to sex with demon spirits because of the intensive visualization involved. Jesus taught that if a person lost it in his her mind, that they had already committed the sexual sin. I believe this applies to masturbation also. These problems are very real, brothers and sisters in Christ. We as Christian workers must have much patience and love to help people to have victory in these areas. Over and over again I have emphasized the need for the Christian to purge or cleanse himself. At the time this book was being prepared for printing, I received a beautiful letter from a young lady who took the information given and prepared for war and completely cleansed herself through the power of Jesus Christ. I want to print a portion of that letter here to encourage the readers that you can cleanse yourself. When I first read your book, there was so much valuable information that I read it once, then went back to take notes. The Holy Spirit really opened my eyes and heart to dealing with some things. I had been trying to cast the demons out of myself for about a year prior to reading your book. One thing the Holy Spirit showed me was that I was actually trying to name and cast each and every demon out. Oops. Your book helped me to cast out the head demon and his underlings and all their doorways. Much easier, of course. All this time I was casting out surface demons, at least the ones I knew about. Many times the Lord would bring something else to my attention to cast out. None of this was easy, it was terrible. 
but they actually left and then there would be worse and deeper ones to cast out. The Lord was very gracious to me during this time as he wouldn't give me too much to handle and always gave me rest. And, gave me a beautiful Christian husband that would be there with the Bible and prayer whenever I needed it, which was a lot. We kept going deeper and deeper to the demons that I could handle, sounds easy in this letter, eh? It wasn't, but I got to a stop and knew I wasn't completely delivered. Then I got your book Prepare for War and did what you told me to. Later, I did everything you wrote about in chapter 17. Because I was never involved in the occult like Elaine, I didn't think I could have a guiding spirit, or a demon that connected me to the spirit world. But the Lord kept bringing that section of your book to my attention and several things happened. One night I saw a Christian girl that went to a church we had attended for a while and didn't like. I kept telling my husband it wasn't a dream that I had actually seen her and that she must be a witch. That didn't go with your claim that the Lord doesn't want us to see in the spirit world, only Jesus will let us see if it's his will. So I realized I must have a demon that connected me to the spirit world. Finally one afternoon I went into a deep sleep and had a dream. In this dream was a man who was dark and I had known him a long time and I trusted and loved this man. He had kept me safe during my life. We were in a building and he put me in a boat and was driving the boat back to Egypt when we soared into a fog and hit a rock and the boat burst apart. Then I saw him laying like he was dead with candles around and other people. People? I couldn't see their faces, were weeping and saying that if I didn't want him to go he wouldn't. That I was responsible for his death. Were you? When I awoke and told my husband about the dream he said it sounded like something he learned in art history. Because the water we were on wasn't a lake or ocean, but more like a river, my husband compared it to the burial practices of the pharaohs in Egypt. That they would actually build a boat for the dead person's journey on the river to the other side. I realized I did indeed have a guiding spirit because he drove the boat and the whole time always had me in something. I never got out by myself. He always directed everything. And the connecting demon was the river for the boat to go back and forth. I knew I had to cast them out. I sort of put it off because I was scared. I prayed and prayed. Then the day I was going to cast them out, I suddenly began to get tears in my flesh which started to bleed. It was scary. My husband said I better get busy and cast them out because this was the worst I had ever been. So, we cast them out then cast out all their underlings. This wasn't easy and the next day I was exhausted. Then I couldn't stop crying and later kept throwing up, you know, a general terrible mess. We kept praying and reading the Bible and then I understood what it was. One of my major demons was what I will call Snatch. He was put in me when I was a baby and he has snatched things away from me all my life. Memories, insight, the Lord Jesus trying to speak to me, anything. Just. Poof and it was gone. That's why I couldn't remember anything and that's why other people such as a Christian counselor had such control over me. They would just have Snatch make things disappear so I wouldn't remember. He would also snatch any sound I would hear and many times I would be confused as if the things I heard were in my imagination or what. After casting him out, I suddenly saw a demon that I had actually bowed down to and given my soul to. We cast him out and I immediately fell asleep, but the dreams and visions were horrible so I prayed and the Lord commanded me to get rid of visions and all of his underlings and imagination and all of his underlings and all of their doorways. I am exhausted. But, I have tears of real joy finally. Finally, I can have a conversation with Jesus and not have something snatch it away. Finally, I can memorize scriptures. Now Bible reading is such a joy. During the time I was casting out the demons, I was in terrible torment. But I claimed a sound mind because Jesus promised and I asked the Holy Spirit to restrain the demons so I could cast them out. A couple of days before the Lord revealed to me that I did indeed have those demons, I was given a decision. I could stay this way for the rest of my life or I could have the Lord clean them out. I decided to let him clean them out because they were interfering with my walk with Jesus. I also understood it wouldn't be easy. It's like our walk with Jesus is a series of yeses because he won't push or force. Rebecca, it's important for people to understand that, 
If you were born into the occult and even if you didn't have anything to do with them and was always forced, you still receive demons. Because of my parents they had legal ground. And casting out the demons is not a pleasant experience but it is worth it. A thousand times worth it so we can actually have the assurance that Jesus is real. Now, I have the assurance of an abundant life, whatever he has in store for me. Left double quotation mark. I extend my heartfelt thanks to the writer of this letter. I pray that many Christians will follow her example and step out boldly in faith to purge themselves. Let us all seek to become vessels of honor. Chapter 13. Deliverance of those involved in Satanism. Satanism is a problem in our land that isn't going to just go away. It is vast beyond anything that has been portrayed in the press. Every city and town has covens or groups of people who directly worship and serve Satan. Just about every junior high and high school has its own coven, including some Christian schools. In addition to this, our country is being flooded with Asian religions which are another form of Satanism, and Egyptian and Caribbean cults, such as the Santeria, all forms of Satanism. Every religion that worships and serves demons is a form of Satanism, no matter what the demons are called. Energies, vibrations, pagan gods, spirit entities, etc. At a police conference in February of 1986 in Las Vegas, it was estimated that there were approximately 40,060, 000 ritual homicides, human sacrifices, in the U.S. in the previous year. I consider that estimate to be extremely conservative. Recent press coverage of the human sacrifices performed at Matamoros, Mexico, in 1989, will shortly become daily events in the media. Everywhere, law enforcement departments are beginning to try to educate police officers in the field of occult-related crimes. Psychologists and psychiatrists are holding medical conferences to try to educate themselves about how to deal with people involved in Satanism. Ritualistic child abuse is becoming a household word these days. Rock music stars and their albums are peddling blatant Satanism in their concerts, all through our music stores and on the popular MTV, every day. More and more hue and cry is being raised that we've got to stop the spread of Satanism among star teens. Unfortunately, the world and many Christians are turning to the psychiatrist and psychologist for the answers. Most do not realize that the field of psychiatry and psychology has probably the highest saturation of practicing Satanists in it of any field of endeavor. The founding fathers of the whole field of psychology were deeply involved in the occult themselves. We must turn our attention back to God's word for the answers. Jesus predicted that this would happen. So did Paul and many others. We are living in the last days, Paul wrote in the second letter to Timothy this accurate description of the days in which we live. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce-breakers, false accusers, incontinent, no self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, conceited, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, religion, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, that one simple paragraph describes in a nutshell any person who worships and serves Satan. Then Paul goes on to say, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3 16. 17. I believe that within a year or so of the publishing of this book Christian churches will come under direct and open attack by Satanists. Recently, 
We were in South Carolina and picked up a local newspaper. On the front page was a picture of a small local country Christian church. Across the front of the church sprayed in black paint were the words Satan is God, it won't be long, and those of us who serve Jesus Christ will have to directly face those who serve Satan and face-to-face -face confrontations. In the month of May, 1989, I spoke with a pastor who is a traveling evangelist. He told me of six churches that he personally knew of in the states of Texas and Oklahoma whose doors were closed because of threats from the local Satanists. Neither the pastors nor the members of the church were willing to stand up to the satanic death threats. This same evangelist also told me of a church in Texas where the pastor was approached by the high priest of the local satanic coven who demanded the use of the church building. In this case the pastor told the high priest that he couldn't have the building. The prompt response was a death threat. The pastor answered, in life or death, I will serve Jesus. I am not afraid of death. You cannot use this building. About two weeks later, the Satanists broke into the church and sacrificed a baby on the altar in the front of the church and desecrated it, leaving the dead baby for the church members to find. Still the pastor and some of the church members stood for Christ. As a result, about three weeks later, a revival broke out in the town, and many have come to Jesus. I also know of a church in South Carolina that was closed down and several people in the church were killed in strange accidents. They had received threats from the local Satanists. This will, I believe, become a very common occurrence within the next couple of years. Ever since the publishing of my first book in the fall of 1986, Letters have poured into me from people who have suffered every kind of atrocity imaginable at the hands of Satan's servants. My heart breaks as I read these stories. One human being cannot touch another's sorrow. Only the Lord can help a person cope with all the terrible hurt that comes into his life. But through it all, we must remember that Jesus loved and died even for such as these. It has been my custom for years to petition the Lord for the souls of every servant Satan sends to try to hurt me. I figure that if Satan is going to use his servants against me, that I should at least have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. I have seen many hardened Satanists who are sent to harm must become completely broken and turn to Jesus. This must always be our goal. I have recently come under much criticism because I do not give specific names and places in my books or report the incidents to secular authorities. I want to make one thing very clear. My calling from the Lord is to bring people out of captivity to Satan and to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I deliberately left those details out of my books. If I had wanted them known, I would have published them. Satan is a spirit and his kingdom is in the spirit world. My battle is not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 12. But more than that, I have been specifically called by God to use only weapons with divine power, not the weapons of the world. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. The only answer to Satanism and the crimes associated with it is in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross at Calvary. My calling is to bring people out of Satanism and to set them free through a total commitment to Jesus Christ. I applaud the police efforts, but they are severely hampered by two things. One, they do not believe in the reality of the spirit world or that the Satanists have any real power at all. Two. They cannot begin to cope with what is going on without the power of Jesus Christ and the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Our jails are full of Satanists. According to a recent TV news documentary, here in California our jails are so full that most of the criminals are back out on the streets in a few days because there simply isn't enough space in the jails to house them all. What in the world is the solution to this terrible state of affairs? It is time we Christians rose up and started obeying Christ's command, to share the gospel with every man with power. This is the whole issue of Satanism, power. Every person who becomes involved does so for one central purpose, to gain power. This is as old as the Garden of Eden itself. Why did Adam and Eve disobey God? Because they thought they would gain special knowledge and thereby power to become as God himself. 
Rebellion is at the core of the lives of every person involved in Satanism. This is also true of those in Satanism who have been very abused. No matter how abused they have been, or how passive they seem, every one of them has a hard core of rebellion so strong that I never cease to be amazed by it. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. 1 Samuel 15:23. This tendency towards rebellion is something we all have to deal with, but especially those involved in Satanism. Always remember, passivity is the very worst form of rebellion possible. God hates passivity more than anything else. He made us very clear in Revelation 3 in the letter to the church of Laodicea. Because the Laodiceans were lukewarm, that is, passive, the Lord said he would spew them out of his mouth, Revelation 3:15-16. Some of the most difficult Satanists to work with are the breeders. The breeders are the women used to have children for sacrifice. They are so difficult to work with, because they have chosen to rebel through passivity. They have refused to do anything against the terrible since they are told to commit. One of the first things I must do when I am approached by anyone who says he or she wants to come out of Satanism, is pray. I must seek the Lord in prayer to be sure that it is his will that I work with that person. I must also talk to the person not only to see if he is willing to make Jesus his total master, but also to see if he is willing to pay the price involved in such a commitment. The majority of people involved in Satanism are not willing to pay the price involved in a total commitment to Jesus. They simply want relief from their current torment. They are typical of all human beings, we Christians included. About the only thing that makes any of us want to turn away from the sin in our lives is the fact that we finally become so miserable that we are willing to give up that sin to obtain something better. The prodigal son in the parable given by Jesus is a typical example of this. He had to get down to eating with the pigs he fed before he was willing to give up his life of sin. Many times in counseling situations, I have to come to the point of simply praying with the person and asking the Lord to deal with them however he feels is necessary to bring them to the point of being willing to give up Satanism completely. As long as they feel that Satanism will benefit them more than it will hurt them, they will be unwilling to give it up. Perhaps this sounds harsh, but it is the truth. Most people come out of Satanism only when they realize that they will most likely lose their life if they stay in any longer. In the case histories given in this chapter, you will find that this is almost always the turning point. Working with people coming out of the occult is not easy. I have made just about every mistake possible to make. I must warn Christian workers in this field of two very real problem areas. First, the hard fact is that most people are looking for a free ride, that is, they want someone else to fight for them and provide for them. Most people get into the occult in the first place because they think they can gain a lot without having to work. I have learned the hard way that it is necessary to place firm time limits on how long you will help and support someone. You cannot support people indefinitely. And, as long as you will support someone, usually that person will make no effort to support himself. Paul directly addresses this issue in 2 Thessalonians, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work, and eat their own bread. 2 Thessalonians 3 10 12. Secondly, there is a growing number of people pretending to be ex-Satanists, or pretending to have been ritualistically abused as a child. This is a problem, which will no doubt increase as the amount of press exposure of Satanism increases. These people come requesting support and attention. I am sometimes amazed at how much information they can pick up by reading and from the demons they allow to come into them through their claims to be demonized and to have been Satanists. Sometimes the Lord seems to deliberately withhold discernment in these cases. I can only suppose this is so that the person will have an unconditional chance for salvation. However, in the long run, they will reveal their deception through refusing to work and their continual attempts to gain attention, most often through fake illnesses and demonic attacks. No ministry is safe from these problems. Anyone can be infiltrated. 
I can testify that such people bring untold grief and trouble. But, I dare not allow myself to become bitter. I must always remember that Christ loves even such as these. Fear. The Christian worker must always understand that people who are truly coming out of Satanism are ruled by fear. Fear is Satan's number one tool. Satan's kingdom is run on the principle of absolute competition. Satanists cannot trust anyone, it is every man for himself. They cooperate together only as they are forced to do so by the demons, through fear. The world of Satanism is also a world of lies. Satanists are accomplished liars and actors. That is the only way they survive. When they come out of Satanism, they will be extremely fearful and habitual liars. It takes time for them to see that the power of the Lord is greater than anything Satan or his demons have. It takes time as well for them to break the habit of lying about everything. It takes much loving, patience, and endurance on the part of the Christian worker helping them. Satanists reject everything and, consequently, feel rejected by everything and everyone. In the nine years that I have had a steady stream of people living in my home who have come out of Satanism, I have found continually that they interpret everything as rejection. If I ask one of them to sweat a fly on the wall, he she will interpret that as rejection. It takes much love and patience to help them recognize and overcome this. Conviction does not come to those coming out of Satanism immediately. Our Lord is so very merciful and gracious. He knows very well that, if he dumped the conviction of the terribleness of their actions on them all at once, they would lose their mind. As the person grows stronger in the Lord, the Holy Spirit brings to them the conviction of their deeds. We Christian workers must understand that these people have been through such terrible things, they cannot remember them all at once. It is normal for people coming out of Satanism to have significant amnesia. Total deliverance is usually not possible immediately because there is so much they will not remember. This is especially true in the case of the various inserts and episodes of ritual sex. We are weak human beings. Our minds can take only so much. Our Lord knows that. He does not push any of us beyond what we can stand. As they grow stronger and more secure in Christ, He will then release more and more of their memories. I have found that it takes a minimum of one year for anyone coming out of Satanism to stabilize. During that year, the Lord will bring back to their memory more and more of the rituals and contracts in which they have been involved. Most of their demons can be kicked out at the beginning, but more and more will be revealed as they remember more of what they have participated in. It is important that, as these things are remembered, the people repent of them, confess them as sin and ask the Lord's forgiveness and cleansing. Much healing comes when we repent and confess our sins. These people are wounded lambs in the Lord's flock and must be tended with gentle firmness and great love. I am going to give two complete case histories in this chapter to try to show more clearly my approach. I still kick out the demons by the sins through which they enter. But in the case of someone involved in any form of demon worship, you must also deal directly with their familiar spirits, or those demons with whom the people worked closely. The people involved always know the names of the demons with whom they worked. If they try to tell you they do not, they are lying. You must ask them for the names of their familiar spirits. Usually, there are several, not just one or two, as you will see by the case histories. It is not necessary to know the names of any of the other demons within these people. You should not ask the demons themselves for their names. Talk to the person about his life, looking for doorways. In these cases, I have given first the histories and shown the doorways. Next I have listed their familiar spirits. Then, lastly, I have given our approach to their deliverances. You must list five categories for deliverance. Familiar spirits. Blood contracts. Episodes of ritual sex. Inserts. Doorways. Case number one, Marie, not your real name. Marie was 21 years old at the time she came out of the craft and turned her life over to Jesus Christ. Her story is as follows, Marie's mother was in Satanism, and, in fact, reached a high position. She married a fellow Satanist, but the two were separated and divorced a month before Marie's birth. Marie's father was considered to be mentally retarded, although he was able to work. 
he never reached a position of any rank within the craft. He left Marie's mother for another witch within the group. At the time of Marie's birth, Satan told her mother that she would be mentally retarded like her father. Unfortunately, Marie's mother accepted this lie from Satan without question. Interestingly, Marie was not only dedicated to Satan as an infant, but also to Jesus Christ. This was because at the time of her birth, her mother held a significant position in the Christian church she had infiltrated. I have no doubt at all that the Lord took that dedication seriously, and, 21 years later, fulfilled it by bringing Marie to himself. At the age of four, Marie was taken to a special coven meeting, by her mother, where she signed her first contract in blood, selling herself to Satan. Marie very clearly remembers that, at the time of signing that contract, Satan appeared to her and gave her a demon named Kamauer. Satan told her that Kamauer would give her the ability to play the part of being mentally retarded which would enable her to get her mother to do anything she wanted. Sadly, Marie used that demon to perfection for the next 17 years. She is actually a very intelligent girl. But she continually flunked everything in school, tested out mentally retarded in all psychiatric evaluations, and convinced everyone that she actually was mentally retarded. Now she faces life with no education to speak of and little in the way of job opportunities. Marie's mother took her to some coven meetings, but mostly kept her away from them always fearing that Satan would demand her sacrifice. Marie was an incredibly pampered child. No one ever said no to her, and neither did her. Grandparents. She had everything money could buy. Both sets of grandparents tried to make up to Marie for the abuse they had given to her mother as a child. She was almost completely undisciplined. When Marie was 11 years old, her mother left the craft and accepted Jesus Christ. That's when the trouble began. As is usual with people coming out of the craft, Marie's mother lost everything. Eventually, she moved to another state as well, leaving the grandparents behind. Suddenly, Marie found that she was no longer worshipped by her mother, that someone else had taken that position in her life, Jesus. And Marie hated Jesus and the Christians helping her mother with all of her heart. She rebelled against everybody and everything continually. When they moved out of her home state, Marie stayed in touch with the high priestess who took her mother's place. She worked with that woman until she was 21 years old. Marie associated with the kids who were into Satanism at the various public schools she attended. She participated frequently in animal sacrifice, and as she got older, attended human sacrifices as well, climbing the ladder within the craft even as her mother had done before her. Marie also trained in palm reading, tarot card reading, and recruited many kids into the craft by showing them how to play with the Ouija board. She became fascinated with horoscopes and followed hers faithfully. At the age of 17, she became involved in a gang which quickly led her into drugs, drinking, and multiple sexual contacts. She showed off to the other kids by cursing God every chance she got. At the age of 17, she had a baby out of wedlock. Her mother would not permit her to have an abortion and, because she was a minor, forced her to give up the baby for adoption. It was most fortunate her mother did this, because Marie would probably have sacrificed the child had she been permitted to keep it. Although she was not allowed to have rock music in the home, Marie listened to it constantly when she was away from home. At the age of 18, after the birth of her baby, Marie went back to her grandparents for a visit, and also visited her father. While there, she and her father had sex. Marie lied about everything she did. She delighted in going to every occultic and horror movie she could. She also got involved in Dungeons and Dragons and occultic video games. Finally, at the age of 19, after she had finished high school in a special education program for the mentally retarded, her mother sent her back to her grandparents as she could no longer have Marie in their house. Marie repeatedly tried to kill her mother, both by witchcraft, and physically. She persisted in believing that Satan was stronger than Jesus Christ in spite of everything her mother said or did to try to persuade her otherwise. Marie hated the whole world, and felt that the whole world hated her. She bitterly hated her mother most of all for leaving the craft and their change in circumstances. 
Once Marie returned to her home state, her formal training in a satanic coven began. She was given a new and powerful spirit guide called Malachi, and a gatekeeper or power demon by the name of Gosser. Marie herself chose to call this particular demon Gosser. She chose to become what is known as a huntress, which is a professional assassin. She was taught how to use all kinds of weapons, stars, poison darts, spears, swords, etc. She started school in the martial arts, kung fu and karate. However, she was too lazy to stand any kind of really rigorous physical training, so she mostly just acquired the various demons. She both used and peddled drugs. Marie refused to work, and was placed into a governmental welfare program for the mentally retarded. She came under the care of two psychiatrists working for the government who were Satanists. These men taught her much in the occult arts, especially in the area of hypnosis, astral projection, and yoga. She lived in a group home run by the government. This did not hinder her activities as most of the people working in the social services programs in that area were Satanists in her own large coven. It was during that two-year period that she entered more and more into human sacrifice and cannibalism, along with frequent animal sacrifice. Finally, at the age of 21, she was given a big assignment. She was promised the position of high priestess, of a local coven, if she succeeded, and promised death if she failed. In reality, Marie was a loser, both in the craft and without. She never completed her craft training because of her laziness. She was always looking for the easy way out and a free ride. She was sent out here to California to infiltrate and kill me. Now I have, for years, had the policy of petitioning Father for the souls of every servant Satan sends to harm us. I figure that if Satan is going to send them to hurt us, that I should at least have equal time to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Father seems to agree with my point of view as he usually allows me to share the gospel with them. Satan must send his servants against us at his own risk, the risk of losing them to Jesus Christ, my master. After all, that seems only fair to me. On the Lord's command, I took Marie into our home. She was with us for two weeks before she broke and confessed the whole plot to us. She realized that the power of Jesus Christ was too strong and realized that she would never be successful in killing me. She feared for her life, with good cause. Just prior to being sent out here, she was forced to watch the brutal killing of a 17-year-old boy who had failed in a similar assignment for her coven. She was told that, if she failed in killing us, that she, too, would be sacrificed in the same manner. Fearing for her life, Marie became willing to commit her life to Jesus Christ and give up her demons. However, her walk has been a most difficult one. She continues to be lazy and rebellious. Marie quite simply does not want to work or take responsibility for herself. She does not want to serve Jesus on his terms. She wants everything her own way. Marie lived with me for six weeks. Then I forced her to move out and go to work. The struggle for Marie's soul continues at the time of the writing of this book. But, here is how we approached her initial deliverance. In addition to the doorways listed above, I asked Marie to make a list of the demons she knew well and worked with frequently. The Lord has shown me that people involved deeply in the craft must rebuke by name and cast out those demons with whom they worked closely. Those demons are listed below with their function. Not all of their names may be spelled correctly as Marie was not ever interested in how they were spelled, just how their names sounded. As is common within the craft. Many of the demons she named herself. Demons do not care much what names people call them. They just want to enter into and control the people. Malachi, Spirit Guide. Gosser, Gatekeeper or Power Demon which gave her the ability to astral project. Dozer, Key Master, this demon opened up any doors on houses, cars, or safes. She also sent him out to confuse and blind drivers to cause car and truck accidents. Death, a demon placed in every person who signs a contract with Satan. This demon's function is to bring about the physical death of the person he inhabits in the event that person turns away from Satan to Jesus Christ. Kony, gave Marie the ability to pass out but still know what was going on around her. Kefle, 
received through first sexual contact, function greatly in lust and seduction of sexual partners. Simuse gave her the ability to drink as much as she wanted to without passing out. Also, this demon could affect the equipment so that she could have high alcohol levels and still pass the breathalyzer tests. Cuma used to influence drug sellers so she could bring down their prices. Thus she could obtain drugs far below the street rate and then make a greater profit. Siski received from the psychiatrist the first time he hypnotized her. This demon placed pink light around her to protect her silver cord when she astral projected. Salumia came in through a suicide attempt. His purpose was to remain in her so that, if she ever decided to commit suicide again, he would perform the following. 1. Hold off all of her other demons so they could not stop her from taking her life too. Notify other Satanists so that her suicide would become a sacrifice ninja style. A ninja style suicide is for her to hang upside down, take a sword or dagger and carve out her heart and guts. If she didn't want to do this at the last moment, the other Satanists would do it for her. Once Salumia was set in motion, nothing could stop him not even Marie herself. She was promised that, if she decided to sacrifice herself in this manner for Satan, that she would be given a higher ranking in hell. Satan's Kingdom. Lanarker, used in all forms of fortune telling. A demon of divination. Desi, received the first time she blasphemed God. This demon made a mantra out of swear words, and gave her some knowledge of Spanish so that she could swear in Spanish in front of others who did not speak the language. That way she would not get in trouble for swearing. This demon made her use extremely foul language almost continually. Demi, came in through the first nightmare on Elm Street. Movie she saw. He and other demons gave her the ability to watch all sorts of horror and torture without feeling any emotions except a sort of a high. These films also became training films as she was learning the skills of an assassin. Kim Lumlu, demon of rock music. Head demon that came in while she listened to rock music. This demon, and those under him enabled her to understand the lyrics, the back masking, and to listen to the music at very loud levels without hearing damage. Labu, received in a special ceremony to give her strength and to guide her hands in ritualistic killings. Many people get what is called a bloodlust through sacrifices. Once they have killed, they have an overwhelming desire to shed blood again and again. Convino, energy vampire demon. Marie could, with this demon, draw the strength out of any person she chose. Unless I bound this demon in her, Marie could sit down beside me and, within less than 10 minutes, I would be so weak I could not sit up. She received this demon at the age of four and used him extensively to afflict others all of her life. Silencer, demon of quietness used in martial arts training. He would have enabled Marie to move with absolute silence had she continued in martial arts training. Kisim, demon of runaways. She pulled him out of some other kid at the group home. He helped her to escape and run away from the group home whenever she wanted and she could use them to afflict other kids to make them want to run away from their parents' home. Commodore, demon of mental retardation. Marie acted mentally retarded with great expertise. She is actually very intelligent and has normal reading skills. Kielma, Marie frequently sent this demon out to destroy a person's job. Anyone who made her angry usually ended up losing his or her job within a few months because of this demon. She received him at the age of six and used him regularly thereafter. Dova, demon of illness, came into Marie at the age of six. She very frequently used him to afflict other people and animals with all sorts of illnesses. Germona, received as a part of her training to become a huntress. He gave her skills with all sorts of weaponry. Once again, because of her laziness, she did not progress very far with her training and did not learn to use this demon well. Alka, demon of emotional control, came in through practicing yoga positions. She asked him in because she had a violent temper. This demon helped her to control her temper when she needed to for her benefit so she could keep a clear head in situations in which she would not otherwise have done so. Kafa, Marie asked this demon in to give her the ability to win at any game especially video games. Since her deliverance, she is unable to play. Any type of video game with skill. 
Legion. Marie invited this demon in at one of the gang rituals while she was a member of Satan's demons in high school. The picture of this demon as he appears in the spirit world is on the back of the jackets worn by these particular gang members. He is sort of the mascot of the gang and inhabits all the members. In summary, we approached Marie's deliverance as follows. She got down on her knees and asked Jesus Christ to forgive her of her sins and become her Lord and Savior. She renounced her involvement in Satanism and made a clear announcement to Satan and his demons that she would never serve them again as long as she lived, that she was now a servant of Jesus Christ. She asked Father for his forgiveness for using a spirit guide. Then she commanded Malachi to leave her at once in the name of Jesus. This demon caused her great pain in spite of all commands for him to be bound. Marie had to be willing to suffer this pain to be set free. She rebuked this demon and commanded him to come out over and over again for about five minutes before he finally left. Marie asked forgiveness for her contact with the spirit world and then kicked out Gosser, the gatekeeper. Marie kicked out the death demon so he could not interfere with the rest of the deliverance. I usually always approach a deliverance of people involved in Satanism in this manner. The death demon must come out very early in the deliverance or he will cause much physical damage and distress. After kicking out her spirit guide, Malachi, and her gatekeeper, Gosser, and the death demon, Marie was then ready to deal with all the other familiar spirit demons with whom she had worked so often. Each specific demon in the list of familiar spirits was rebuked individually and kicked out. Marie prayed first, asking the Lord to forgive her for allowing that particular demon to live in her and work with her. Then she commanded the demon to leave. The demon that gave her the most trouble was Kamaur. That was because she allowed Kamaur so much control of her mind to act mentally retarded. Kamaur knocked her unconscious twice, and made her very confused a number of times. Each time, we would help her gain control, and then demand that she control that demon with the power and authority given to her by Jesus Christ. Once Marie gained the upper hand and was able to bind Kamaur, in the name of Jesus, and was able to stop him from controlling her mind, he had to come out. Then, after the specific demons were kicked out, we went back and started on the doorways. Again, Marie prayed first for forgiveness, and then commanded every demon to leave her at once that came in through each doorway. The doorways were Inheritance Dungeons and Dragons Horoscopes General Occult Games Blood Contracts Witchcraft Animal sacrifices, drugs, murder, kung fu, karate, rebellion, human sacrifices, drunkness, drinking, multiple sexual relationships, blood, animal and human, cannibalism, hypnosis, blasphemy, incest, tarot cards, palm reading, Ouija board, yoga, ritual sex, rock music. Occult and horror movies. Lastly, we did a final and general clearing of the following areas with the following prayers. Spirit. Sever between soul and spirit. Mind. Will. Emotions. Physical body. Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for my sinful use of my spirit and to completely cleanse my spirit of any remaining demons. I ask you to seal it so that no one can ever control it again, except you. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Statement, now, in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord, I command every demon remaining in, or afflicting my spirit, to leave me at once. Never again will my spirit be used to serve Satan or any of your demons. Sever between soul and spirit, Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask you to completely and forever take away my ability to communicate with the spirit world in any way, except what the Holy Spirit wants me to receive. Therefore, I am asking you to once and for all sever between my soul and spirit as in Hebrews 4.12 and remove all demons that gave me the ability to control my spirit and communicate with the spirit world. Statement, now, in the name of Jesus Christ. I command all demons linking my soul and spirit which give me the ability to communicate with the spirit world and astral project to leave me at once. Mind, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to completely cleanse and heal and renew my mind. 
I want to use my mind to serve and honor you. Please forgive me for living the lie of mental retardation and for using my mind to serve Satan. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command every demon left in my mind, or afflicting my mind, to leave me at once. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me for rebelling against you for so many years. Please cleanse my will and send your Holy Spirit to work in my will to will to do your good pleasure. See Philippians 2.13 Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command every demon in my will, or afflicting my will, to leave me at once. Emotion, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me for all my hatred and bitterness and lust and every other sinful emotion. Please cleanse my emotions and heal them so that they will be pleasing to you. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord, I command every demon in my emotions, or afflicting my emotions, to leave me at once. Physical body, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I sincerely repent for all the terrible things I have done with my body, sinning against you. Please forgive me and cleanse me and heal my physical body. Statement, in the name of Jesus Christ. I command every demon left within my physical body to leave me at once. After Marie was finally delivered, we had her pray and ask God the Father to fill her with the Holy Spirit. She was placed on an intensive Bible study and memorization program. Unfortunately, she quickly began to refuse to continue the study because she did not want to discipline herself. She lived with us for six weeks and then moved out. We are still in touch with her, but... Marie has not yet decided once and for all that she will serve Jesus Christ totally. She is in a very dangerous position. You cannot sit on the fence with God for very long. Scripture says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10:31. Case number 2. Jane, not your real name, was 14 years old when I first saw her. Her story is a very sobering one. It clearly demonstrates the power of the Ouija board which most people consider to be just a game. It is even more sobering when you stop to think about the fact that just about every high school and junior high school here in the U.S. has an Ouija board club. In fact, the Ouija board has become the number one best-selling game in the United States. I have talked with many, many teens who are involved with Ouija boards. Frequently, I ask them if they ever want to stop playing but the spirits want to continue. Over and over again I am told that yes, this does sometimes happen, and if they disobey the spirits, the spirits get really mean and throw the board around the room or hurt the kids in some way. My next question is always, then why do you mess around with these spirits? They always tell me that they have good spirits to protect them from the mean or bad spirits. What a tragedy. Jane was brought to me by her aunt who was, fortunately, a true Christian. The aunt, whom I will call Deborah, not your real name, found Jane and her 14-year-old friend trying to sacrifice their niece, Deborah's 10-month-old daughter. Praise God, instead of running to the police, Deborah ran to the Lord and brought Jane to a commitment to Jesus Christ. She then brought Jane to me. For help in clearing out the demons. Jane's story. Jane knew very little about inheritance. Her father and mother were divorced. When Jane was young, as is so common, Jane was raised in a one-parent household, by her mother. Her mother was not a Christian, but sporadically attended the Christian Science Church, not a Christian church. To Jane's knowledge, her mother was not involved in the occult directly. Doorways, inheritance, father, unknown, mother, Christian science. Heavy metal rock music was played in Jane's home from infancy. She and her mother attended rock concerts and watched MTV. Jane demonstrated the typical pattern for a youngster whose life is saturated with rock music. By the time Jane was 10 and 11 years old, she was sexually active with multiple partners, all boys. Doorways, multiple sexual partners. In her 11th year, Jane began to do drugs. In the cheer. She experimented with PCP, crystal, LSD, acid, bennies, speed, marijuana, and cocaine. I asked her how she got these drugs. Her reply was, unfortunately, very common. Oh, that was easy. I just got them at school. 
All the schools have drug pushers. You can get anything you want. Doorways, street drugs. When Jane was 13, she got a boyfriend who was 16 years old. His name was Bobby. Jane and Bobby were very much in love, however, Bobby was a fourth generation Satanist. But, for some reason, Bobby did not want to be involved in Satanism. He strongly warned Jane to never get involved in Satanism. He also warned her to be very careful not to call up demons, that demons could be very dangerous. Six months after they met, Bobby was murdered by the local Satanists. Jane was devastated. Doorways, demons of occultism from Bobby. By this time, Jane was in high school. Because of her grief over Bobby, she did not become sexually involved with any other boys and decided to go straight and stop taking drugs because Bobby had told her these were bad for her. However, as is so very common here in the U.S., Jane's high school English teacher was an occultist. She had the students do research papers on witchcraft under the guise of studying medieval culture. Jane went to the school library and found many books on the occult. She felt a great drawing from inside of herself to study the occult. This came from the demons she had received from. Having sex with Bobby, she found books with all sorts of incantations in the high school library. But, she also found much information on Ouija boards. This really caught her interest as she wondered if she could contact Bobby through the Ouija board. The books she read told her that Ouija boards are often used to contact spirits of dead people. Doorways, Ouija board, spirit guide, Bobby. She asked her mother to buy her an Ouija board. Her mother did so thinking it was just a game. Because of the demons already inside of Jane, she learned to use the Ouija board very quickly. She contacted spirits directly through the board. Quickly she contacted a spirit that said he was Bobby. However, within a few months, Jane figured out that this spirit was not the Bobby she had known, but simply a demon masquerading as Bobby. She accepted this spirit as a spirit guide. She then obtained two other spirit guides called Black and CAA. She was so enthusiastic about the Ouija board that she got her friend Susan, not her real name, who was also 14, to join her in using the board. Doorways, Ouija board, spirit guide, Bobby, spirit guide Black and CAA. CAA was the most powerful of the demon spirit guides. He gave Jane a satanic name of Anna. He did this when Jane signed a contract selling herself to Satan. In just three months from the time Jane first started using the board, these demons led her into signing a contract in her own blood selling herself to Satan, body, soul, and spirit. Then, self-mutilation, drinking of her own blood and the blood of her friend Susan, blasphemy of God, desecration of Christian churches, animal sacrifice, astral projection, all sorts of incantations and Finally, the attempted human sacrifice which CAA said was necessary so that Jane could become a bride of Satan. Please remember, this all happened in just three months. Jane never, at any time, had contact with other Satanists or a Satanic coven of any kind. All of this came about through her contact with the spirit world through the Ouija board. Doorways, Satanic name of Anna, blood contract with Satan, self-mutilation, blood drinking. Blasphemy of God, church desecration, animal sacrifice, astral projection, human sacrifice, incantations. Jane and her friend had become very unpopular at school because it became known amongst the other kids that Jane had the ability to inflict illness and all sorts of accidents on anyone who made her mad. Jane and Susan became close friends and withdrew from the other kids at school. One week before the two girls tried to sacrifice Deborah's baby. Jane had an experience that greatly frightened her. She was sitting in class when CAA appeared to her and told her that she would gain much more power if she would allow CAA to come inside of her. Jane agreed, and followed CAA's instructions to call him into her. He came in with such force that Jane was knocked out of her chair onto the classroom floor. She was engulfed in searing heat and cried out in pain. Then she had a convulsion. I asked her what happened then. She said that her teacher just thought she had overdosed on drugs and asked Susan to help her down to the nurse's office to lie down for a while. The convulsion was of short duration, and though Jane was groggy afterwards, she could walk. 
Susan helped her down to the nurse's office. She lay down there for an hour or two and then returned to class. I was horrified. But Jane, I exclaimed, didn't the teacher want to send you to the hospital or report you to the authorities if she thought you were taking drugs? Oh no, was Jane's reply. There are so many kids on drugs at school that the teachers just look the other way. If they reported all the kids on drugs, there wouldn't be any kids left in class. Besides, many of the teachers are on drugs of some sort themselves. What a terrible state our country has fallen into. Not only was Jane terribly frightened by CAA's painful entrance, CAA was very cruel to her. Jane began to remember all the warnings Bobby had given her. But she was trapped. She didn't know what to do. CAA was obviously much more powerful than she was. He told her that she could never get rid of him. It was because CAA had threatened her with torment and death that she tried to sacrifice her aunt's baby to appease him. She readily accepted Jesus Christ once she found out that he could set her free from the demonic torment and bondage she was experiencing. Her friend was not so willing, and has, the last I heard, returned to Satanism. I had asked Jane to make up a list of the doorways in her life before I saw her. She did so, very accurately, I might add, along with very accurate drawings of what her three spirit guides looked like. She is a talented artist for one so young. The three familiar demons Jane worked with were Bobby Black CAA Jane's doorways were Inheritance Rock music and MTV Multiple sexual contacts Drugs Occult demons through sex with Bobby, the Satanist Ouija board Blood contract with Satan Self-mutilation Drinking of human and animal blood Animal sacrifice Blasphemy of God Desecration of Christian churches Incantations of all sorts Astral projection Attempted human sacrifice I asked Jane if she knew what it meant to blaspheme God. She defined the word correctly. I then asked her how she knew the correct spelling of the word as this is not a common word in the vocabulary of a 14-year-old. Her answer was oh, Black spelled it out for me on the Ouija board. Because of her involvement with the Ouija board, astral projection, and because Jane had gained the ability to communicate with the demons. Directly without the aid of the Ouija board, it was clear that the link between her soul and spirit had been formed. As I talked with Jane, I found that she was a very intelligent girl. I told her that she now had more power in the name of Jesus than the demons had. Oh good! She exclaimed. Does that mean that I can get rid of these demons? Yes, I said. When, was her immediate question. I was delighted to be able to answer. Right now. In her deliverance, Jane first made an announcement to Satan and the demons that she would no longer serve them that she was now a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then she kicked out the three familiar spirit demons who had become her spirit guides. Please see sample prayers and statements in case number one, then she kicked out a demon of death who was afflicting her physically. She had a real struggle to kick out CAA. This demon tried to take over her voice to growl through her and tried to knock her out. This child was so determined to get rid of him that I did not have to coach or instruct her about what to do. She would slap her hand over her mouth to stop the growl, swallow hard, and say, No. In the name of Jesus, I command you to be bound, CAA. You will never control me again. The struggle was intense, but Jane never gave up for a moment. Oh the faith of children. How beautiful and simple it is. After getting rid of the four demons, Jane then went through and repented for her sins and confessed them and closed all the doorways. I had talked to her very seriously before starting the deliverance and told her that, if she chose to make Jesus Christ her master, that meant she could never again have sex until she got married and never again do drugs or obtain power through demons. She said she understood that and was willing to agree to that. This girl was smart. She realized how much trouble these sins had brought into her life and was willing to make a complete change. After closing the doorways, Jane undid a general cleansing of spirit. Sever between soul and spirit. Mind. Will. Emotions. Physical body. Please see sample prayers and statements given for case number one. Lastly, 
She prayed and asked the Lord to fill her up with his Holy Spirit, everywhere the demons had been. I kept track of Jane through her aunt and her local pastor for about a year after her deliverance. Jane left her mother's home and moved in with her aunt. She had trouble with nightmares, and the demons attacked her day and night for several months with thoughts that she wasn't really saved, or wasn't really delivered. Jane persevered. Her aunt was a great help to her. The last I heard, Jane was still serving Jesus and growing in the Lord. She had to sever her friendship with Susan, however, because Susan refused to give up her sexual and occultic activities. Both girls were offered the same gospel and the same opportunity for deliverance. The one chose eternal life, the other, eternal death. Satan is after our children. Jane was just a child in physical age, but an old woman in sin. How many Janes are there, I wonder? How I pray that our Lord will reach down into the lives of these youngsters and bring them to committed Christians willing to pay the price to help them be set free. Not very many Christians would be willing to help Jane in the way her aunt did after finding Jane in the very act of trying to kill her baby. Truly this is what Jesus meant when he commanded us to love our enemies. Satanic Ritualistic Abuse More and more psychiatrists, psychologists, and Christian workers are being faced with the problem of helping people who are abused in satanic rituals. Some are still young, but most are adults who have survived the abuse. This is an area that is extremely difficult to deal with. Many times the adults will have an almost complete loss of memory of their childhood. Once again, I must say that this is an area where I still have more questions than answers. Each person I see helps me to learn more. I am going to give a case history here of a young woman I worked with recently to illustrate some of the problems faced, and my approach to deliverance. Linz, not your real name, story. Lynn grew up a very troubled young woman, but it was not until she turned 25 that she began to find out why. During her high school year she took drugs continually and drank heavily as well. Finally, at the age of 19, some teens her age shared the gospel with her. She accepted Jesus Christ at the age of 19, but she continued to have terrible struggles. She quit taking everything except pot, marijuana. By the time she turned 21, the Lord convicted her that she had not made Jesus Christ the master in her life. It was at that time that she quit pot. Just quitting drugs was not the answer for Lynn. She continued to have struggles with deep depression and great difficulties in her spiritual walk. She attempted to commit suicide 20 times before the age of 25. She had continual and very painful problems physically with her reproductive tract. When she finally married, sexual intercourse was extremely painful. She had extensive vaginal and uterine scarring for which she had no explanation. In her 25th year, she began to see a Christian psychologist. During counseling, she abruptly realized that she had no memories at all of her childhood. Over the next seven painful years, she began to retrieve memories of her childhood until at last she had a pretty complete picture of what had happened to her. She went to several counselors, but just remembering wasn't enough. Somehow, she had to put an end to the torment and the difficulties in her walk with the Lord. Then, she came across my books. As she read them, she came to the realization that she must need deliverance. I met her when she was 34 years old. Lynn was ritualistically abused as a child, and also in her teens. Because Lynn's story is so long and complex. I am simply going to summarize it here, and then make a list of the doorways at the end. Lynn was born into a family where her father was a Satanist associated with one of the well-known groups here in the U.S. Lynn still does not know how involved her mother was. Her mother spent much time in the hospital during Lynn's childhood. Lynn was dedicated to Satan as a baby, more specifically, to Prince Satan. Eternal Father, Satan, one of her earliest memories was of a scary thing put into her as a baby. This scary thing must have been a demon. She was put through various purification ceremonies which were all sexual rituals. She was forced into sex with people, animals, and demons. She was also used in child pornography and snuff films. She was abused with every sort of sexual perversion possible. During one of the rituals, salt was poured into her vagina. 
This is a common ritual. Salt is always used in the occult for the placement of demons of destruction. No doubt, all products of her womb were dedicated to be sacrifices to Satan. These salt rituals are sometimes called salt protection rituals. Lynn had many memories of human sacrifices, both children and adults. She was forced into cannibalism and drinking of blood. Parts of some of these sacrifices involved a ritual of washing her hands in the blood of the victims. She was given a secret name which was actually a craft name. This was first given to her during what was called a rebirthing ceremony. During the rebirthing ceremony, she was placed inside the abdominal cavity of both a dead human and an animal after their sacrifice. She was also placed in a coffin and buried in the ground for a period of time and supposedly rebirthed when she was brought out of the ground. The terror she experienced during these rituals is beyond description. At the age of four, Lynn was so severely abused that she nearly died. Here is that experience as Lynn wrote it in her diary of memories. I remember lying on a cold table with bright lights that hurt my eyes. I must have realized what was going on because I knew I could die and I really wanted to. I can remember letting the blackness take me. The blackness felt wonderful. No pain, no hurt, no tears, just nothing but warmth and a feeling of eternal patience. I fully understood this. It was like, we have all the time in eternity, slow down, don't rush. Relax, breath me in. Then I saw the Lord standing off to my left with his arms to his sides. Oh the bliss I felt when I looked at his face. Such love, such patience and sadness. It immediately felt like I was running, pushing, struggling to get closer to him, to jump into his arms. But it was like a strong father holding his three-year-old, holding her off the ground while her feet are still moving. I became frustrated and yelled, Lord. I want to come home it was then that I really focused in on the sadness I had briefly noticed earlier. I suddenly felt this terror and panic in my heart that I knew I couldn't stay. I would have to go back. Oh the little girl screamed in terror and pain, please Jesus, please big brother, don't tell me to go back. I can't. It hurts too much. I want to stay, and on and on and on. I pleaded. And then just broke down in sobs knowing I would go back because that's what he wanted. He never moved, just looked into my heart and mind, shook his head and said, Not yet my little one. You will understand one day. I love you, he talked to me more, but I can't remember. And I was suddenly feeling slapped in the face, saw the bright lights again as I opened my eyes. I was angry because I was back. From then on I've been in. Conflict with wanting to go back home and knowing there is something to be done here. Lynn continues, After my near-death experience I knew deep inside that the cult had been lying to me and although I was angry for not being able to go home, I held on to that experience. I went through the motions and did what I was told, but I vowed that they would never have me completely. I knew. The light was stronger than Prince said in the Eternal Father. Why else were they so openly disturbed about a three or four year old child talking to the light, they had taught me to use telepathy and, that time, I turned it against them. I blocked that part of my mind and they never knew what happened during my near death experience. They had lost me, I belonged to Jesus and they could not do anything about it. Although Lynn never told anyone about her experience, those around her somehow knew that she had had an experience with Jesus Christ. They kept telling her that she must have nothing to do with Jesus. They accused her of bringing the light into the meeting, and even killed a small boy about her age to punish her for bringing the light into the meetings. Then they did a special ritual to place a wall in her mind so that she could not get over the wall to Jesus. But, the victory had been won. No matter how Lynn was tormented after that day, the Satanists never gained complete control of her mind. Part of her was owned by Jesus from that day on. However, later, when Lynn did accept Christ in her adult life, that wall in her brain still remained. She could not read the scriptures, was completely unable to memorize scripture, and had greatest difficulty praying. Once this wall was removed during her deliverance, she was set free to be able to read and memorize scripture and pray. Lynn quickly learned to fly, as she described it. This was, in reality, astral projection. She also quickly learned to dissociate, 
blanking her mind and stepping out of her body to avoid the physical pain she experienced. She was placed in cages along with other children. She was hypnotized and learned to perform hypnosis herself. She was forced to learn to use the demons to walk through fire and breathe underwater. Worst of all, she was put through a black hole ceremony. This is a practice that is rapidly growing here in the U.S. I have known very few survivors of it. The hole is in the ground. No one I have talked to coming out of Satanism knows if these holes are dug by humans or opened up by demons. I suspect the later because no one I have talked to has ever known a human to be involved in the digging of these Satan pits, as they are called. The children are impaled with metal hooks, usually placed in their legs or groin area. They are cut in the genital area so that they bleed freely. Then they are suspended down into these seemingly bottomless holes where the demons come up to molest them in any way they want. The freely flowing blood attracts the demons upwards much more quickly. Usually the children die, but a very few do survive. Lynn was one of the few survivors. She received severe physical damage, the scars of which she still bears today. During one of the ceremonies she remembers a steel rod being placed in her back which gave her much pain all of her life until the demons making up the rod were cast out during deliverance. Lynn quickly learned various demonic skills such as the art of levitation, calling up spirits in seances, playing with the Ouija board, starting fire without matches, fortune telling through rod and pendulum. She signed several blood covenants and was given several seals and yokes. She learned to use visualization and especially, she was given a secret number in addition to her secret name. She formed a very close relationship with a young man whom she called Michael. Michael exerted very powerful demonic mind control over her. Various cues were placed into Lynn. These were such things as certain colors. Her father sent her a birthday card recently that was almost completely green. As soon as she saw that particular color of green, she immediately experienced a tremendous urge to return to her father so that he could take her back to the craft members. After deliverance, the cues no longer affected her. She was given a powerful demon spirit guide named Tal at the age of six. Her school pictures show a remarkable difference in the five-year-old prior to receiving the demon spirit guide, and the seven-year-old with the spirit guide. She was taken to ceremonies in Festus, Corpus Christi, California and Egypt. As she grew older, she participated heavily in rock music and drugs. She learned many of the demons by name and used them in various incantations. As the memories came flooding back, the Satanists contacted her again and she began to struggle with an overwhelming urge to go back to the cult. She was married to a Christian man in her late twenties who helped her to resist the urges to go back to Satanism. At the age of 34, we met and talked. I felt the Lord was leading me to help her clear out the many demons that had come into her through the years of abuse and participation in satanic rituals. Lynn came and stayed with my husband and I for a week. The struggle was intense, but she was completely set free at last. Below is a list of her doorways, followed by the approach we took to clearing out the demons. Inheritance. Baby dedication to set and Satan, called Eternal Father. Scary thing placed into her as baby. Roman Catholicism, baptism, communion, confirmation. Praying to saints, false tongues, novena, and rosary. Sex, sexual molestation, group sex, ritual sex, lesbianism, pornography, snuff films, sex with demons, sex with animals, sex with other children. Salt protection ritual, rebirthing ceremonies. Human sacrifices, cannibalism, blood drinking, blood covenants, secret name and number, fire walking, levitation, seances, Ouija board, underwater breathing, wall and brain against Jesus, steel rod in back, black hole ceremony, Satan's pit, black mass, animal sacrifices, cage torture, astral protection, dissociation. Blanking mind, esp, and telepathy. Rod and pendulum. Ceremonies in Festus, Corpus Christi, California and Egypt seals, yokes, pacts, bondage to Michael. Various power ceremonies. Telekinesis. 
Each of these doorways was prayed about, confessed, and then closed, and the demons that came into her commanded to leave in the name of Jesus. It took us about three days just to work through the list of doorways. The struggle was intense because Lynn was so used to escaping torment by simply blanking her mind, or astral projecting out of her body. Over and over again, Lynn could not remember what she was supposed to pray for. Then she could not bring herself to rebuke the demons and command them to leave in the name of Jesus. The demons would blank out her mind or stimulate her to astral project. The demons created a tremendous drain on me also. Both of us battled with exhaustion and sleepiness. Much of Lynn's deliverance was done on our feet pacing the floor to help us stay awake and alert. Early on in the deliverance, I told Lynn to kick out her demon spirit guide, Tall. At that point, she was still having some difficulty recognizing what was her and what was the demon. She was so used to having demon spirits dwell in her that she had difficulty recognizing the difference between them and herself. As I talked to her about getting rid of Tual, she suddenly said, Why should I tell him to go? He has never hurt me. I knew at once that that thought was from the demon. With the guidance of the Holy Spirit I replied, Can you honestly tell me you do not think Tual was ever jealous of your relationship with your husband or tried to keep you from entering into a close relationship with him? Lynn looked surprised, then sheepish. She admitted that she did realize that Tall was a major obstacle to her forming a close relationship with her husband. I began talking about how Tall was a born loser and had chosen to serve a master who was a loser and how Tall was going to lose his home and Lynn forever. Lynn sat for a couple of minutes without saying anything. Then she spoke up saying, I suppose it is only my free will that keeps me from letting Tall speak through me to cuss you out. I laughed and answered that indeed it was. As the demon got angry at me over the things I was saying, Lynn began to recognize for the first time with some clarity the difference between the demon and herself. Lynn herself was not angry because I said the demon was a loser, but she began to feel intense anger at me. It was a real step in her deliverance. Once she recognized the difference between the demon and herself, she was better able to fight against the demon and kick him out. Here is Lynn's description of the incident. At different times in my life, I would think that I felt an alien presence in myself but immediately the thought would come into my mind that it was only me. I was just an evil person and these thoughts belonged to and were entirely mine. Two days into my deliverance with Rebecca, she and the Lord finally got it through my head that these were not my thoughts but the demons within me. That was a big breakthrough for me. I then began to see Satan's deceit and lies holding me in captivity. The purpose was to keep me feeling such self-content and self-hatred that I would never feel worthy enough to believe Jesus Christ loved me and would forgive me. Lynn's deliverance began to move forward more smoothly after she learned to recognize the difference between the demons and herself. The next area we had to deal with was the problem with Lynn's passive mind. She used the technique of dissociation blanking her mind and leaving her body to keep from feeling the tremendous physical torment during her abuse. There seemed to be no victory in this area. We struggled a whole day with the problem. Time and time again, when Lynn tried to address the demons that came into her through the blanking of her mind or astral projection, she would blank out. I even had her write out the simple prayers and statements on a large sheet of paper. She was first unable to write the words then unable to read or understand them once they were written. Finally, after much prayer, I realized that she needed to confess, as sin, the fact that she had almost completely given up her free will. Then asked the Lord to restore to her her free will. The struggle to make that confession and then pray that prayer was one of the most intense ones of her deliverance. But at last, Lynn won through and the victory was won. Once this was done, she was then able to address the demons that had come into her through these things and kick them out in the name of Jesus. Fortunately, Lynn retained enough control that she did not become a multiple personality as so many abused children do. I still have big questions in this whole area of multiple personalities. I firmly believe that a big percentage of the multiple personalities are simply demons that take over and control the person. But, I also wonder if an abdication of the free will does not allow the personality to fractionate. 
Will the confession of this as sin and a prayer asking the Lord to restore the free will be a key to integrating a person? I freely admit that I do not have the complete understanding of this whole complex problem, or the solutions. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit will give Christian workers the guidance they need. Another difficult area was the control Michael exerted in her life. Once, a couple of years before, a therapist had tried to get Lynn to regress to about six years of age and then declared the tie between her and Michael to be severed. Lynn was not able to do so. As Lynn and I discussed the incident, I realized the folly of such an approach. A small child would not have the ability to stand against a strong adult, especially one that used physical abuse to punish them. Of course, Lynn couldn't break such a bond. She needed the strength of Jesus Christ to do so, and she did not have that strength at the age of six. But, as an adult, she had the strength in Jesus Christ to sever the bond. This is a big trap that many psychologists and psychiatrists fall into. They ask a person to remember an incident that occurred to them as a child, then, as the child to deal with the situation. How ridiculous! If the child had the strength to do so, they would have done so when the situation first happened. Be careful, much of the regression therapy being done is demonic. Never permit hypnosis. All hypnosis is demonic. The Holy Spirit is able to help a Christian remember what happened to them in childhood. And, the Holy Spirit will bring back only those memories necessary for the person's cleansing. Step by step the doorways were closed. The blood contracts severed. The inserts renounced and the Lord asked to remove them. Lynn did not know what inserts she had received, but we had to assume that she had received several. Major changes occurred as we asked the Lord to remove them. The last step was to go through and specifically kick out, by name, all the demons that Lynn knew personally. She had a list of about 50 names. As she worked through that list and commanded each one to leave, suddenly she began to cry. I can't go on. If I do, there won't be anything of Lynn left. I'm disappearing into nothingness. We stopped and I assured her that this feeling of emptiness was normal. After the demons were out, we would pray and ask the Holy Spirit to fill her and remove the emptiness. It took a step of faith and obedience for Lynn to finish commanding all the demons to leave in spite of the pain she felt. She had had demons. Indwelling her from birth. She had never experienced being without them. This feeling of emptiness is very common in such situations. After she finished the list of familiar spirits, she then went through the general cleansing I have listed in previous case histories of body, soul, and spirit. After she was all done, we anointed her with oil and joined with her in prayer asking the Holy Spirit to completely fill her. We also prayed asking the Lord to erase her painful memories and heal all demonic damage done to her physical body and to her emotions and spirit. She said that the feeling of emptiness grew less and less as she spent most of her time reading the Bible and praying over the next week. She could feel herself literally becoming filled with God's Word. Changes Lynn experienced after her deliverance, for a few weeks, she became very clumsy and felt as if she did not know how to control her own body. This is because since birth, she was used to having the demons operate in her body. Lynn can now read and understand scripture for the first time in her life. She can also pray freely and can memorize scripture. She felt a great lightness, as if a heavy burden had been lifted from her. She can now laugh and experience all of the whole range of human emotions now. She was blocked from feeling emotions before. Lynn can now write and play music. She knew she had a gift in this area, but was able to write only briefly after first accepting Christ in 1974. Now she can write freely. Lynn had experienced a great improvement in her relationship with her husband, both emotionally and physically. She no longer has pain with sexual intercourse. All five senses now function with much greater clarity, especially her vision. This is common. The demons keep a person from experiencing the physical realm in a normal fashion. This is particularly true in people who have been involved in the Eastern religions where the goal is complete withdrawal from experiencing the physical realm so that the person is aware only of the spirit realm. It is now much easier to combat the demons because they are now on the outside of her rather than the inside. 
Len no longer has the desire to go back to the craft. Also, she no longer has the urges to commit suicide. The area of greatest struggle is to keep her mind from blanking out, especially around satanic high days. She still has to fight occasionally as members of the craft come and try to force her to astral project. She feels a tug on her spirit as they try to take her spirit out of her body. However, now she can rebuke them in the name of Jesus and completely stop them from being able to take her in the spirit to rituals. She has lost her ability to see into the spirit world. Lynn still has nightmares, but she can handle them now through the power of Christ. She cannot levitate now and has lost her ability of mental telepathy. She is no longer affected by the cues, i.e., one cue was to drown herself, causing her to intensely fear water. That fear is now gone. Another cue was ringing bells, such as church bells. When she heard bells ringing, she was supposed to astral project. This cue no longer has any effect on her. Lynn's struggle has been hard, but she is at last free from demonic torment, overwhelming urges to commit suicide, deep depression, etc. Lynn is at last free to grow in the Lord. The barrier in her mind to keep her from the Lord has been removed. The road to freedom is long and difficult for those who have been ritualistically abused but victory can be won. Chapter 14 To Satanists With Love to those still in Satan's service. I have written this book because I love you. But, more importantly, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty, loves you even more than I do. You may not know your master's name. You may call him the master. Or, you may use other names. However, this master you serve is cruel. He demands pain, suffering, and sacrifices for you to serve him and gain power from him. I want to tell you that there is another God. He is a God who can be served with love and purity. This true God calls your master by the name of Satan. Satan is not the God he says he is. Satan is a liar. He is only a created creature, not the creator. Please stop and think a moment. How many times have you seen Satan and his demon spirits double-cross his servants? Why do the demons constantly demand that you shed blood, particularly your own? Has Satan, or any of the demons, shed any of their blood for you? You know they have not. Tell me, why does your master Satan demand that you do those things that horrify human beings the most? Why does he demand that you torture and kill one another? Why does he demand the lives of your precious little children? Why does he demand torture and abuse of helpless small children? Why does Satan tell you this is the only way to gain power? Why? Have you ever stopped to wonder about these things? Most of you have never experienced real love. You don't know what love is. How my heart longs to tell you that true love does exist. What is true love? Here is the answer. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15 13. The Lord Jesus Christ did this for us. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. How different Jesus is than Satan. Satan demands that you shed blood and perform sacrifices for him. Jesus, on the other hand, sacrificed himself for us. This Jesus who is none other than the true creator God, chose to come down to earth and clothe himself in human flesh. He was born of a virgin and walked this earth as a man without sin. He died on a cruel cross and took our just punishment upon himself. But death could not hold him because he is very God. Jesus arose from the grave on the third day. He is not chained in hell as you have been told. He is very much alive and currently sits in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1, 1-3, Oh I beg of you, please read a little farther. You can get out of Satanism and live. Sister Courage, Sister Fortress, the Black Knight, and many, many others are living witnesses to this. Jesus is stronger than Satan. 
That is why these people have all come out of the craft and are still alive. What a harsh master you serve. How many times have you seen Satan's servants killed because they failed or made a mistake? Ah, but I serve a master that does not kill his servants if they fail. In fact, he died in my place, taking my punishment upon himself. Satan would never do that. Do you know that the price and just punishment for every evil you have done has been paid in full? Jesus paid it on the cross nearly 2,000 years ago. Everything you have done can be wiped away. All your bitterness, hatred, jealousy, pride, fear, and evil can be wiped away and be replaced with gentleness, love, peace, compassion, and purity. All this is possible if only you will turn from serving Satan and make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior and Master. Please, please listen to me. Why continue in such bondage? Why walk every day in fear? You are in such terrible bondage. To maintain your power, you must constantly perform sacrifices and endless rituals. You dare not miss a satanic high day or you will be severely punished. If you do any little thing wrong, you will be punished. Sometimes you have done nothing at all wrong and you are still punished. Nearly every one of you suffers from some sort of demonic illness. Why? Please think. Why do the demons punish and torment you so many times if they care about you as they say they do? Oh how different it is to serve my Master, Jesus Christ. This is what my Master has to say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11 28 30. The truth is that Satan and the demons hate all human beings. They know that Jesus is alive and well. They know that Jesus offers forgiveness for sins and eternal life. It is their goal to keep as many people as possible from accepting Christ. They want as many people as possible to suffer for all eternity in hell. Satan hates you. Satan is a liar. His promises to you are lies. Has he promised you power, money, and fame? My master says. For what shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8 36 37. You may gain wealth, but you won't gain peace or eternal life. The only way to have love, peace, and eternal life is through Jesus. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me, John 14, 6. I urge you to get down on your knees and ask Jesus to be your Lord, Savior, and Master. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock, if any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20 Won't you open the door of your heart? How do you do this? Just get down on your knees right where you are and ask Jesus to forgive you and cleanse you from all your sins. Ask him to become your Lord and Master. Then ask the Lord to place his precious Holy Spirit within you. If you have made Jesus your Lord, then tell Satan and his demons that you will never serve them again. Command them to get out of your life forever in the name of Jesus. There are people who care, people who are true servants of Jesus Christ who will help you. Pray and ask the Lord to bring you to them. Will you accept Jesus? Today before it is too late? Remember, you are in my prayers and the prayers of many others. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before your throne today in the precious name of Jesus Christ. I come before your throne to petition you for each precious soul caught in Satan's cruel grasp. Father. I petition you to bind the demons so each person can have at least one chance to hear about Jesus and accept him. Father God, I petition you for each one that does accept Jesus. I petition you to send your angels to surround and protect them. I petition you to guide them to true Christians who will help them. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before your throne to counter petition Satan for every soul that comes out of the craft to you. I petition that you will not allow Satan to sacrifice these people or overwhelm them or lead them to false Christians. I petition you, Father God, 
that every soul that comes out of Satanism will in turn be raised up to bring many more people out of Satanism into the wonderful kingdom of Jesus Christ. I thank you and praise you Father for all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Epilogue. Surprised by joy. This book contains some of my adventures in the service of my master over the past four years. So much has happened and I have learned so much in the past ten years since I first started in this ministry. This walk has been a very lonely one and the warfare has been intense. But, after 41 years, 15 of them walking closely with the Lord, he has brought a most wonderful blessing into my life. He brought me a godly man to be my husband. What a surprise and joy this event has been. The blessing and increase in strength both physically and spiritually this union has wrought in my life is more than I can describe. Now Daniel and I are joined together as one to continue this fight as servants of our beloved Master, Jesus Christ. We are close to the end. The return of our Lord is near. It is our prayer that each of you reading this book will be strengthened in the difficult days to come. May all praise and glory and honor be unto our wonderful God forever and ever. Appendix A. Breaking up fallow ground. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Hosea 10:12. Do you feel a distance in your relationship with the Lord? Do you feel you are not where you should be with him? Do you have difficulty praying? I would suggest you sit down and take a careful, prayerful look at your life. If you are in this condition, chances are you have sin in your life that you need to confess. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 8-9. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2, 1. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of keeping short accounts with God. Do not allow unconfessed sin to build up in your life. Nothing destroys your relationship with the Lord faster than unconfessed sin. What does it mean to break up fallow ground? Fallow ground is hard ground that has not been plowed for several years. The hard ground must be plowed up and broken down into softer dirt so that plants can grow in it. As we allow unconfessed sin to build up in our lives, our hearts become hardened toward the Lord. In this section, I want to present some material that is not original with me. Many of the thoughts come from a book by Charles Finney called Lectures on Revival. I would strongly recommend that you obtain this book and read it. This is an outline of sins that are common to all mankind. I have combined some of Finney's thoughts with the things that the Lord has taught me in my own life. Examine the state of your mind to see where you are right now. Many never think about this. They pay no attention to their own hearts, and never know whether or not they are doing well spiritually, whether they are gaining ground or going back, fruitful or lying waste. Shift your attention from everything else and look into this. Make a business of it. Don't be in a hurry. Examine thoroughly the state of your heart and see where you are. Self. Examination consists in looking at your life, considering your actions. Remembering the past and learning its true character. General confessions of sin will never do. Your sins were committed one by one, and as best as you can they should be reviewed and repented of one at a time. Lectures on Revival, by Charles Finney, Bethany House Publishers, 1988, pages 30-31. Now, before you start reading the rest of this section, do you have a paper and pen in your hand so that you can write down the sins the Holy Spirit brings to your mind? Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus I ask that you will, by your Holy Spirit, work in the lives of all people reading this. Bring to their memories the unconfessed sins in their lives. Shine your light of purity and holiness down into their lives. Help us all to be willing to bear the pain of looking at our sins so that we may be clean before you. Work in each of us so that we may become vessels of honor in your service. I thank you for this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Sins of Commission. Material Possessions. What is your attitude towards your earthly possessions? Do you put them before God and others? Do you think you can do with them what you want? 
Are you willing to lose everything for the Lord? If you are not, then you need to confess this as sin. So many Christians are completely unable to hear the Lord telling them to make a move, for example, because they are too locked into the security of their current living situations and jobs. Many Christians have been warned by the Lord to prepare for the time of coming hardship and persecution, but they are unwilling to reduce their standard of living to do so. They want to continue living as well as they can until the last possible moment. Are you one of these? Pride. How many times have you been vain about how your looks? How many times have you been hurt because others did not pay attention to you or compliment or thank you for something you did? How many times did you do something to become the center of attention? Do you look down on others as being less than yourself? This is sin. Envy. How many times have you envied others, their looks, possessions, or even their positions and functions within the body of Christ? How many times have you talked about or dwelt on other people's shortcomings to make yourself look better? Write down these instances of sin. Criticalness. Being critical of others allows a root of bitterness and then hatred to spring up within you. Bitterness and hatred will destroy you. Take a hard look at your daily conversations and thoughts. Are you critical of others? You don't think you have bitterness in your life? Remember, the heart is very deceitful. A good measure of bitterness is this, how easily do other people make you angry? How often do you have angry thoughts about someone? Anger is very often a symptom of bitterness. Slander. Have you ever passed on gossip? The Lord hates slander and gossip. How many times have you spoken behind people's backs about their faults, real or imagined, unnecessarily or without good reason? How often have you assumed you knew what was in someone's heart? Only God knows our hearts. I have been amazed at the willingness of Christians to accept accusations against me without ever once contacting me to see if there is another side to the story. These Christians are also more than willing to pass on accusations against me without ever making an effort to validate them one way or another. What about the various Christian research organizations that distribute information on people? Have you ever stopped to wonder if their information is accurate? I know for a fact that those passing out accusations against me have never once contacted me. That makes me think they have probably not contacted others either. If you pass on such information and it is really slander, you are sinning. You are, in fact, guilty of shedding innocent blood murder. Lack of appropriate seriousness. How many times have you treated God lightly or spoken about God lightly? Scripture admonishes us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9:10. Do you lack proper respect for this God of ours? If so, that is sin. Lying. Lying is any deliberate deception. Examine your daily life. How often do you lie, passing it off as just a little white lie? How often do you exaggerate? All lies are sin. Cheating. Have you gone through the line at a grocery store and not said anything when the clerk mistakenly rang up less than the amount you owed? If so, you have cheated. Cheating is any time you have done to someone something you wouldn't want done to you. Write down the instances where you have done this. Hypocrisy. How many times have you confessed since you really didn't intend to quit? How many times have you pretended to be something you were not? Robbing God. List all the times God wanted you to help someone or share the gospel with someone and you did not do it. Are you wasting time on recreation or other pursuits when God wants to send you out into the harvest to bring souls to Jesus? Do you have time to watch TV but not for a daily quiet time? Bad temper. Scripture tells us to be angry and sin not. We as Christians must discipline ourselves. If we are bad tempered, then we are sinning. We can choose not to take offense at what someone else does. Keeping others from being useful. Have you weakened someone by criticizing him so that he is afraid to step out in faith and function as God wants? Are you a complainer? Do you waste other people's time by complaining about your own problems? Are you wasting your pastor's time by demanding endless counseling sessions with him? All this is sin. Rebellion. How often have you refused to obey someone in authority over you? How often have you read God's word with no intention of obeying what you found in it? How often have you known something that you should do but have not done it? 
How often has the Lord told you to do something and you have not done it? Remember, God regards rebellion very seriously. Six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Proverbs 6 16, 19. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21, 7-8. Look at the list in these few verses alone. Lying. Pride. Shedding innocent blood. This is done most effectively through gossip. False witness. Sowing discord among the brethren. Murdering. Involvement in the occult. Sexual immorality. Unbelief. Fearfulness. Idolatry. Sorcery or witchcraft. Rebellion. Sins of omission. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James 4:17. Ingratitude. How many times has God helped you and you have never thanked Him? The clothes on your back, the food on your table, your health, your family, your job, everything is given to you by the Lord. How often do you thank Him for these blessings? Do you eat without first stopping to sincerely thank God for His provision for you? If so, you are sinning. Do you travel to work and back without an accident? You should thank God for His protection. Write down every instance you can think of when you have not thanked God for His provisions for you. Lack of love for God. If you love someone, you talk to him and spend time with him. Have you neglected to love God? This is sin. Neglect of the Bible. Put down the spans of time when, for days, or even weeks or months, you disdain God's Word. When you do read God's Word, do you do it in a manner that is pleasing to Him? We must read the Bible with the attitude that we will immediately obey every commandment we find there. Unbelief. How many times have you virtually charged God with lying? Do you believe His word? If not, this is sin. Neglecting prayer. How many times have you skipped personal and or family prayer? We greatly offend God by not praying. Neglecting the means of grace. We are commanded to fellowship with others. If you are not doing this, you are sinning. The way you perform duties. Do you do everything unto the Lord? Or are you lazy and slipshod in your work and everyday life? This is sin. Do you do only those things at work your boss demands? You are required by Jesus to go the extra mile. Are you lazy and doing the Lord's work? How many times have you known things you should do and have not done them? How many times have you known you should do something like take out the trash or do the dishes and you have not done it? Write down these instances and confess them as sin. Lack of love for your neighbor's souls. It is your responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone around you. How many people do you know and associate with that you have not shared the gospel with? Write them down. It is sin. Every Christian is commanded by God to share the gospel with others. If you are not doing this, you are sinning. As you make your list of sins, you should really make up three lists, a list of all sins that have allowed demons to come into your life, a list of all the rest of your sins, a list of everyone that has hurt you or sinned against you in some way. You must forgive all of these people in order to receive forgiveness for your own sins. After you have carefully gone through and confessed and repented for all of your sins, kicked out all the demons that came into you through those sins and forgiven everyone who has hurt you, take your list and burn it. You now can start with a completely clean slate before God. You will have been totally set free from bondage to Satan. Appendix B. Satanic High Days. I have had many questions from concerned Christians wanting to know the Satanic High Days. These are the days on which the Satanists perform special rituals and sacrifices. It is so very important that Christians everywhere begin to go before God's throne and counter petition Satan for the sacrifices he does. 
I urge you to pray fervently asking our Lord to stop the human sacrifices and also to have mercy on the little animals being sacrificed and allow them to die before they can be so horribly tortured. The prayers of Christians are effective. I have heard many, many stories from people coming out of Satanism about episodes of interrupted human sacrifices. It is not uncommon for a coven to be gathered around an altar to do a human sacrifice when suddenly, a brilliant shaft of light comes down out of nowhere and lights up the whole altar and surrounding area. When this happens, the victim is not sacrificed and the Satanists flee the scene. I know a number of people who were so shaken up by this shaft of light that they began to search for another god besides Satan and ended up accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Satanic holidays occur on different days around the world in order to set up a network of sacrifices 365 days a year. They vary from one group to another and from one location to another. To name them all would take a book in itself. I will give you the main high days here. Every full moon. Sacrifices are made every night of the full moon in many groups. The demons give people maximum power during the time of the full moon. It is also the time when the incantations are fulfilled that were done earlier in the month. Halloween. The highest time of the year is Halloween. Halloween is considered to be Satan's birthday. Frequently it is called the harvest feast. The rituals and sacrifices to celebrate this time of the year are not just on Halloween night. They run from October 15th through November 15th. Easter and Christmas. The Satanists desecrate every Christian holiday. At Christmas, mostly infant boys are sacrificed to ridicule Jesus Christ. At Easter, and especially on Ash Wednesday, young men are sacrificed along with others as I described and he came to set the captives free. Solstices. Each solstice is celebrated. Spring, summer, winter, and fall. You can find the dates for these on most calendars. New Year. Sacrifices are done on New Year's Eve, but the highest sacrifice is performed at midnight. This is to dedicate the New Year to Satan. I have recently been in contact with a person who came out of a very high position in Satanism. He told me that, starting in the year 1990, Satan has decreed that all covens must perform human sacrifice on a daily basis. Satan's goal is to have a human sacrifice performed somewhere in the world every second. Satan is also pulling all his organizations together to unify them. He knows his time is short. Our Lord's return is near. We as Christians must stand against Satan and his activities in our prayers. This is the end of becoming a vessel of honor. Thank you for listening to the book and I pray that the Lord Jesus will guide you. Please subscribe to my channel, The Watchman.